Thank you very much. Apologies to Patrick Harvey and Willie Rennie as we just don't have quite enough time this afternoon. But we're going to have to move on to the next item of business, which is an Education and Skills Committee debate on Motion 17059 in the name of Claire Adamson on a note of concern, the future of instrumental music tuition in schools. I would encourage all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to seat button whenever they can. And I call it Claire Adamson. Thank you. Presiding officer, it's a pleasure to open the committee debate on behalf of the Education and Skills Committee. Before I lay out the findings of the committee's inquiry, I would like to thank our clerks and everybody who took time to give evidence to the committee, whether that was by in writing, via social media, or as a part of our committee formal meetings or as one of our focus groups. And I see that there's some of those in the uh, gallery today to join us. The passion for learning an instrument was articulated by many young people we met, including from the Scottish Youth Parliament, and I'd like particularly to highlight Alison Ferguson and Catherine Mackey for their pow powerful evidence in the formal committee proceedings. I'd also like to thank the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland and what a treat it was for them to perform for our committee. It perfectly encapsulated why the committee was so keen to find a way forward to preserve for all the opportunities created by a musical education. I would also like to pay tribute to all of those involved in delivering music education and instrumental music tuition throughout Scotland. The dedication shown by those we spoke to was inspiring and added to our determination to investigate and highlight the concerns in this area. In October, the committee opened its inquiry and we wanted to find out the extent to which charging for instrumental music tuition as part of the school curriculum acts as a barrier to participation from pupils. An inquiry was launched in response to correspondence from the Music Education Partnership Group. This is a group brought together by the Scottish Government and is a successor to the Instrument Music Group and Implementation Group. It brings together not only local authorities and others with a stake in instrumental music tuition, but also national music, cultural performing organisations. There was also a parliamentary petition in the matter, which my colleague Joanne Lamont will cover in her closing speech. The committee also focused on groups with young people, practitioners and students from the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. Gordon MacDonald and I attended a North Lanarkshire Schools Music Group evening practice session at Courtbridge High School, where all pupils engaged with the North Lanarkshire bands and orchestras come together each week. We saw a wonderful variety of musical talent, including the now world famous North Lanarkshire Pipe Band, whose performances in New York as part of Tartan Week, as they say, went viral. I want to thank Mr Park and his staff, but especially the pupils who gave their time to highlight the positive benefits of instrumental music tuition and participation and what it had brought to them. We should be clear, of course, that the distinction between instrumental music tuition and musical education. As COSLA notes in its response to a report, all pupils in Scotland from primary one to S3 are taught music by GTCS registered teachers as part of the broad general education. Instrumental music tuition is an additional service provided in all 32 local authorities in Scotland delivered by instructors. The committee's report focuses on instrumental music tuition, but it would be wrong to ignore the strong connection with and influence on musical education in the senior phase of Curriculum for Excellence. The committee's report made several recommendations to COSLA and the Scottish Government. Since her inquiry and report, COSLA has issued fresh guidance to local authorities on instrumental music tuition, but the central question of future funding solution for, for this service remains. I will therefore focus my remarks today on the charging structure for instrumental music tuition, which my fellow committee members will attest was one of the most challenging issues raised in evidence. While all 32 local authorities have agreed not to charge young people who are taking SQA exams in music, for those who have not yet chosen music as an exam subject, there is a much varied picture. Some local authorities do not charge at all. 
others charge for instrumental hire, for the tuition itself, or for both. In some local authority areas, in one local authority area rather, pupils were charged £524 per annum for tuition with no sibling discount, which is a prohibitive sum for many families. We heard that nationally, local authorities spend around £28 million a year on instrumental music tuition and collect roughly £4 million in fees from parents or carers. Those local authorities that do charge also apply a plethora of different exemptions and discounts, some providing a sibling discount for families, where others offer an exemption of discounted fees only to those eligible for free school meals. I would recommend that members read the annual survey collated by the Improvement Service, as well as reading the very insightful evidence provided by Kenny Christie of the Heads of Instrumental Teaching Scotland, Instrumental Teaching Scotland for more examples of the approaches taken in each local authority. The committee supports COSLA's guidance, which states that there should be no charges for those eligible for free school meals but also recommend that there should be an explanation of how other exemptions or concessions could be applied more consistently to help mitigate the impact on hard-pressed families. We also recommend that local authorities should give parents and carers the opportunity to pay in weekly or monthly instalments. COSLA's guidance contains a section on engaging parents and carers, and this provides an example of good practice of a comprehensive parents information booklet, which sets out its fees and exemption criteria in clear, accessible language. In its report, the committee recommended that local authorities communicate more clearly with parents and carers about the full range of costs, exemptions and concessions that may be applicable and we would hope to see common sense approach adopted across Scotland in this regard. However, presiding officer, these recommendations only seek to mitigate the impact of charging, but the committee's key recommendation was that instrumental music tuition should be, in principle, free of charge. We notice with interest that the Scottish Government's response to our report states Instrumental music tuition, which is necessary to provide adequate preparation for SQA exams, should be provided free of charge. But I would ask the Cabinet Secretary whether he agrees that those who give, gave evidence that adequate preparation for SQA examinations doesn't start in S4, but at a much earlier stage in a young person's musical career. The inherent tension encountered by the committee throughout its evidence, evidence gathering was the status of instrumental music tuition and whether, as COSLA argued, it should remain a discretionary additional service or whether, as others argued, it, it, in practice, in reality, it should be an intrinsic part of the curriculum and therefore not subject to charging. In the report, the committee suggests that the explicit inclusion of instrumental music tuition in the core curriculum would have practical implications which would need to be carefully considered. However, the benefits in protecting and enhancing the provision of music tuition in schools could far outweigh these considerations. COSLA's response to this suggestion focused on the practical and financial implications. This may have, rather than the potential benefits for pupils and indeed for instrumental music tuition instructors, who could be provided with improved job security. Indeed, Causa Stephen McCabe recognised this pressure on instructors when giving evidence to the committee, stating, councils are under pressure not just to charge for tuition, but to reduce the number of musical instructors. This is sim a simple reality. Some councils have reduced or have savings options to reduce the number of musical instructors that might involve instructors in instruments that are not practically or popular and where the numbers are limited, being lost. Therefore, instrumental music tuition is that a tutor numbers continue to be cut, the quality of teaching through absolutely no fault of the tutors at all could decline. And many witnesses, including John Wallace from the, the music group said that this is a tipping point for musical tuition in Scottish schools. 
At the heart of the issue, as long as instrumental music tuition is considered to be out with the core curriculum, it is liable to other local authority budgetary pressures and there will be a risk of tutor numbers declining further. As they reduce, more and more large groups of lessons will need to take place rather than the standard of a one-to-one -one tuition. And while fees continue to increase and drive away potential musicians and music teachers of the future. It is vital that we get this right to ensure our music teachers, instrumental music teachers of the future have an opportunity to achieve their ambitions within the Scottish education system. One potential solution proposed in Evidence was to create a ring fence national scheme similar to the Youth Music Initiative, or YMI, to fund this, the instrumental music tuition. The YMI's purpose is to deliver a Scottish Government commitment that every school pupil in Scotland should be offered a year of free music tuition by the time they leave primary school. YMI was universally praised in our deliberations. Although the committee is not persuaded that a national service could perform better than the local services and the instrumental music services should continue to be managed at local authority level, we rec recognise that Youth Music Initiative is an example of good practice where a national objective has been achieved through partnership working with the local authorities. Indeed, Mr Bikay says local authorities will always take a pragmatic decision in the best interest of their communities if the offer of money was on the table, they would look at it and consider what was best in the interest of the communities that they serve. Other committee members will no doubt wish to reflect on their views of the responses that we received from COSLA and the Scottish Government to a report. But in our final recommendation, we say that our number of inquiries, reports and strategies produced regarding instrumental music tuition over the last 20 years while reaching broadly similar conclusions, responses to each have failed to address the tipping point, concerns regarding the future of instrumental um, music tuition in schools. So, presiding officer, I recommend the report to the chamber. I look forward to hearing the views of other members on how the recommendations can be followed through. And I would like to take this opportunity again to thank those young people who have taken part and who are studying in instrumental music in our schools. It should not be a decision based on whether or not your family can afford it. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary, John Swinney, to open for the Government. President Officer, I, I welcome the report from the Education and Skills Committee on Instrumental Music Tuition in Schools and the opportunity that this debate provides for us to air the various questions raised um, on the, su the subject matter of the report. And can I also echo the thanks of the convener to the various interested parties who have given evidence and contributed to the substantial report that we now consider. Um, from the government's perspective, the expressive arts are of great importance to Scotland's culture and to our economy. Participation in music and the arts can have a hugely positive effect on our children, young people and on their families. Being involved in music and the arts provides children and young people with opportunities to be creative, to develop their imaginations and to experience inspiration and enjoyment. This can have a hugely significant positive effect on their mental, emotional, social and physical well-being. Instrumental music tuition in schools is an important element of that participation in the arts and the government fully supports the instrumental music tuition service. There is an instrumental music service operating in every local authority and music education in Scotland has been highly regarded across the United Kingdom and internationally. This was highlighted in the Instrumental Music Group's 2013 report and members across the chamber will have witnessed some of the strength in the provision of instrumental music tuition around the country in their own engagement uh, with schools in their localities and further afield. Um, I've recently had the privilege of experiencing a number of examples for myself of the strength of that instrumental music provision. Um, a few weeks ago I attended the North Lanarkshire Music Group's Spring Concert which showcased the impressive talent and dedication of young people in North Lanarkshire, uh, their teachers and their music instructors. The evening, uh, the outstanding evening at the Glasgow Royal Concert Hall was concluded 
by a performance of, by the North Lanarkshire Schools Pipe Band shortly before uh, their seminal performance in Grand Central Station in New York, in which the young people of North Lanarkshire and their outstanding instructors um, demonstrated the strength of the instrumental music provision in Scotland. Um, I also recently attended the City of Edinburgh Music School annual performance, which um, draws together young people studying at Flora Stevenson Primary School and Broughton High School and is one of the funded music school arrangements uh, around the country and saw at first hand the depth of expertise and experience uh, that the Edinburgh, City of Edinburgh Music School represents. Uh, that I also attended the Music School of Douglas Academy in Mulgai in Eastern Bartonshire, which again attracts young people from around the country to contribute to the development of specialist music education and uh, they were a, a tremendous uh, example of the strength and the formidable base of music education within Scotland. I can fully understand and I share the concerns of young people, their parents and families and those working in the sector over any reduction in the quality or reach of those services in any part of Scotland. As colleagues in this chamber will be aware, the Scottish education system is set up in a way that decision making is devolved to the most appropriate level, enabling local education authorities to make choices that meet their local circumstances and needs. Local authorities decide how to provide instrumental music tuition depending on local circumstances, priorities and traditions. Local authorities are entrusted by statute with taking those decisions. Uh, despite the financial pressures that we have faced as a government, um, we have treated local government fairly in the financial settlements that we have put in place. And within the context of differential positions adopted around the country, a number of local authorities, Dundee, the City of Edinburgh, the City of Glasgow, Orkney, Renfrewshire and West, Western Bartonshire and the Western Isles continue to provide instrumental music tuition free of charge to young people in their localities. Choices are made at local level by individual local authorities. Um, it is up to each local authority to decide how it deploys the resources that are available to it. And I would take this opportunity to encourage local authorities to provide music, instrumental music tuition uh, to pupils within their locality at no cost to the pupils involved. Whilst maintaining respect for the autonomy of our local authorities, the Scottish Government is committed to working collaboratively with partners to, main to maintain instrumental music tuition in Scotland. Following a meeting with the Chair of the Music Education Partnership Group in May last year, uh, Professor John Wallace, I agreed to Scottish Government officials taking part in a working group led by the Music Education Partnership Group with representation from the Government and the Convention of, local uh, of Scottish Local Authorities which would seek solutions to ensure instrumental music tuition remained accessible. The working group secured a commitment from COSLA's Children and Young People Board to a minimum standard of eligibility criteria for access to free instrumental music tuition for those in receipt of free school meals and a restatement of the existing commitment to access to free instrumental music tuition for pupils undertaking SQA qualifications. Guidance for local authorities to consider when taking decisions on funding for instrumental music tuition was developed by the working group and was published by COSLA on the 25th of February this year. The guidance encourages transparency and the involvement of pupils and parents in the decision-making process. It supports good practice in communicating decisions and it offers good practice examples and factors for consideration when applying charges and concessions. The Heads of Instrumental Tuition Scotland and the Association of Directors of Education Scotland were consulted as the guidance was developed and John Wallace has expressed confidence in the guidance uh, that has been produced by the COSLA Young Children and Young People's Board on behalf of the uh, Music Education uh, par uh, Partnership Group. I would like to specifically take this opportunity, presiding officer, to address one of the issues raised uh, by the committee, which is the statutory position regarding instrumental music uh, tuition and a concern that there was a lack of clarity on this question. The expressive arts, including music, are an essential part of the broad general education under Curriculum for Excellence. This can involve the learning of musical instruments on a whole class basis. In addition to this, some children and young people will receive instrumental music tuition. Decisions relating to the provision of instrumental music tuition 
are for education authorities and they have discretion in determining how to provide tuition depending on local circumstances, priorities and traditions. It is my firm view that in making those decisions, local authorities should consider fully the range of benefits that learning a musical instrument can have for our children and young people and the positive impact that it can have on well-being and attainment. It is the responsibility of local authorities to ensure that pupils in their area are not prevented from learning a musical instrument because of their background, location, disability or financial circumstances. Local authorities should also take full account of the child-centred focus of Curriculum for Excellence. In doing so, there should be a recognition that for some young people, learning a specific, a specific instrument will be an important part of their personalised learner experience, one that should provide them with the opportunities to maximise their individual potential. In specific reference to preparation for an SQA qualification, the committee found that there is a lack of clarity regarding whether instrumental music tuition necessary to provide adequate preparation for SQA examinations can legitimately be subject to charging. While there is no express statutory link between education authorities' charging powers and the qualifications framework, the acquisition by pupils of formal education qualifications is clearly a fundamental principle of school education as provided by education authorities. It is therefore my view that instrumental music tuition which is necessary to provide adequate preparation for SQA examinations must be provided free of charge. Furthermore, I do not think there is any dubiety in the guidance that is available. And indeed the COSLA Children and Young People Board agreed at their meeting in November 2018 that no young person or their family would be charged for instrumental music tuition when they are preparing for an SQA qualification. And I welcome that commitment. While the provision of music education in schools is a matter for local authority decision making, the Scottish Government supports access to learning opportunities in music for children and young people through a range of measures. The National Centres of Excellence, four of which focus on music and a number of which I have mentioned already today, are funded through the Local Government Settlement and the Scottish Government supports St Mary's Music School through the Aided Places Scheme. Entry to the school is by audition and assessment based on musical ability and potential. Through the culture budget, we have provided almost £3 million since 2012 to Sistema Scotland and their big noise orchestras, which reaches 2,500 children weekly in Stirling, Glasgow, Aberdeen and the city of Dundee. I am pleased that the committee has welcomed the Scottish Government's support for the Youth Music Initiative as an example of good practice. We have invested £118 million since 2007 in the Youth Music Initiative, helping ensure every pupil is afforded a year of free music tuition by the time they leave primary school. Our investment in the YMI has made a significant impact, helping young people in all 32 local authorities access music-making opportunities. While this is not and never has been intended to replace local provision of instrumental music tuition, the Youth Music in Initiative impacts impact findings published on the 8th of March 2018 show it engaged with over 244,000 young people over the last year. The quality of evidence supporting the link between skills for learning, attainment and the YMI has also greatly improved. In light of the positive impact of the YMI, Scottish Government officials continue to work with Creative Scotland to ensure the Youth Music Initiative builds on its many successes and provides pathways for children into future progression routes, including through local authority instrumental music services. Presiding officer, it is clear there is agreement across the political spectrum in Parliament about the importance of music education in general and instrumental music tuition in particular. In its report, the Education and Skills Committee concluded, and I quote, the committee respects the democratic right of local authorities to take decisions about local expenditure and acknowledge the financial choices they face. However, the committee believes in principle that music tuition should be provided free of charge in every local authority. I agree with that conclusion from the committee. I urge local authorities to reflect on that and for my part, express the Scottish Government's commitment to continue to work with partners to enhance and to preserve instrumental music tuition throughout Scotland. Thank you and I call Liz Smith to open for the Conservative Party. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I 
uh, begin my remarks by reiterating the tributes that the convener paid to all those uh, who supported the committee in its work and to all those who provided evidence, including the petitioners, all those with very specialist knowledge amongst music teachers in our schools, and all the representatives of the Royal Conservatoire whose recent teaching experiences meant that they were particularly well informed about several of the key issues that we are investigating. And can I associate myself with the remarks of the Cabinet Secretary when he acknowledges the tremendous talent that uh, our youngsters in Scotland have. Now, music in whatever capacity should be at the very heart of any curriculum, not just because of the educational and social benefits that it brings, but because it has the potential to transform lives. And uh, members, the convener and the cabinet secretary have already uh, mentioned the very special qualities of the Youth Music Initiative and Sistema. All the evidence that the committee took and I have to say all the evidence that has been available throughout numerous reports over the years confirms that. It has the power to bring families together, schools and whole communities. And there is the additional factor that music provides a self-discipline and very often an ambition for pupils to do well in other subjects too. And at a time when raising attainment is also a central priority for this parliament, nothing could be more important than finding educational channels which motivate our young people to the highest degree. Music is therefore, therefore definitely not to be treated as an optional extra, which in the words of Nicola Benedetti would be a situation that would do untold damage to the cultural fabric of Scotland. Indeed, I could hardly believe the recent comments about instrumental music tuition made by a head teacher in England when he said, and I quote, music is a hobby, it is not a career, it will not be supported by the school. I will not allow children to leave school to take graded exams as we will only be supporting children's learning. Presiding officer, I have seldom read such a depressing statement from anyone in education, but particularly from a head teacher <laughs> who is clearly very ignorant when it comes to the real meaning of education. And I'm very glad to see that on social media, that head teacher was in serious trouble. And it is in the spirit of the real meaning of education that I think we should be debating this afternoon. And the tone has been set by both the convener and by the cabinet secretary, because we know that in principle, music is firmly embedded within the curriculum for excellence. But we also know that its provision, particularly when it comes to instrumental music tuition, is extremely patchy across Scotland. And it is this situation, which often related to the costs uh, of the provision, hence the committee's concerns, which were largely a reflection of the wide variation across different local authorities as to when additional tuition is provided free and when it is not. And I'm very pleased to hear the cabinet secretary saying that that is a matter for all local authorities to reflect upon. The committee felt that one of the biggest worries is the fact that some councils see music tuition as a relatively easy target when it comes to budget cuts and a means of generating additional income, perhaps indeed to subsidize other school services. And that's a situation which I think we all feel distinctly uncomfortable about. And of course, that then led us into the realms about the debate about what should be uh, discretionary and what should be compulsory uh, on a curriculum. And I'm sure it's a debate we uh, won't go uh, very far away from. And I have to say, I'm quite interested in the current legal challenge to the interpretation of the Educational Scotland Act 1980 uh, about what free education provision actually really should mean. I think perhaps the legal terms there um, might not always be exactly the same as what we see as politicians and what teachers see as politicians as uh, the genuine commitment to the curriculum. Of course, the very strong concern of the committee was the extent of the cuts disproportionately affecting disadvantaged communities and the fact that there is a wide variation in the proportion of school pupils taking part in instrumental music tuition a variation of 4 to 26%, which no one could argue is insignificant. And they imply the degree to which different local authorities have different priorities. And personally, at committee, I was very taken with the com commitments that had been made by local authorities, such as Glasgow, which had managed to avoid fee costs being paid to the parents. With these disparities between the better-off communities and the less well-off communities worry us greatly 
not least because young people in our most disadvantaged communities already have it pretty tough when it comes to other aspects of educational experience, whether that's in literacy and numeracy rates, the attainment gap, subject choice, extracurricular opportunity. And it was an issue that I have to say received a great deal of attention during the Royal Conservatoire session, given the reports we heard from trainee music teachers uh, about the difficulties that some of them had observed in schools in the more disadvantaged communities. Presiding officer, we have been told that it may not be possible to completely avoid additional charges altogether. And I think we have to accept that up to a point, given the nature of some of the tuition that is required. If that is the case, and if we accept the evidence which was universally uh, provided to us that local authorities and music teachers themselves did not want to rely on any uh, additional support from private means, however philanthropic that might be, I do think we have to consider some other options which would allow councils perhaps to provide greater bursary support uh, if some additional money can be accessed. What has not yet been tested as far as I can see is perhaps some of the uh, partnership agreements uh, that would involve uh, the music industry and some of the music professionals. And uh, can I just compliment uh, the work that has been done by the MEPG funding uh, aspect, uh, though Cabinet Secretary will be interested in your views. I, th I think I'm right in saying that that funding uh, finishes in um, September. Uh, 2019 and what your commitment might be beyond that because I think these partnership commitments are something that have been uh, very helpful to this whole debate. And at this point, Cabinet Secretary, can I also flag up an issue which I think needs a resolution too, and that is uh, one where the provision of piping instruction, uh, when an offer was made by qualified uh, piping instructors to provide free tuition to four local schools in one geographical area, but because the piping instructors were not employed by the relevant local authority and not therefore registered with that local authority, they were actually not permitted access to the schools. And that meant several interested uh, young people uh, lost out, of course, so did their parents, on the opportunity to take advantage of that free tuition. That's surely not an acceptable practice, and I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can consider that point, maybe with something in mind that permits local authorities to make use of registered, qualified instructors who obviously got PVG qualification uh, and who have recognised uh, credentials. Of course, of course. Jim uh, I thank uh, Liz Smith for taking intervention. I was talking to actually a, a piper uh, at the weekend and they made me aware uh, of that particular issue uh, and actually how the, the, the curriculum within the Royal Scottish Pipe Band Association has certainly moved forward in recent years to actually help uh, with that particular situation so it doesn't actually happen again. Elizabeth, uh, can I just say that I think that's, that's a very encouraging uh, point to make. Um, I'm slightly concerned, though, that there are still some local authorities who, when they have that expertise on their doorstep, it, the mechanism for allowing these people with that expertise to teach uh, is not entirely forthcoming. Of course, one of the other issues that the committee faced was the uneasy balance uh, between recognising the democratic rights of local authorities to make decisions and also ensure that the national education policy ambitions are delivered, a balance that uh, we felt was made all the uh, more difficult by heavy constraints on local authority finances, and of course the, the COSLA briefing makes that clear. Uh, local authorities are quite right to point out that they are democratically accountable to their communities and are largely required um, to set balanced budgets, and so it's not an easy uh, topic uh, for us to deal with, but nonetheless, I, I think it's such an important that one where that free tuition is really something that I think we have to embrace. Uh, I will draw my remarks to a, a close, uh, presiding officer, because I think that there are so many important aspects to this debate, perhaps not always easy to define, but the clear value of instrumental music tuition as such a crucial part of the educational experience for all our young people, uh, no matter who they are, um, it, it's, I think, very plain within the evidence. Uh, these statistics that we have before us just now tell the story of the decline of the number of pupils taking instrumental music tuition. That's why I think this committee report is so important. And I really do be believe that we can harness all the um, concerns of the cross-party group and all the interested parties to do something about it. Thank you very much. And I call on Ian Grade open for the Labour Party. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I suspect uh, there is going to be a little dispute uh, this afternoon regarding the benefits of instrumental tuition and the desirability of making that widely possible for young people. After all, uh, as we've heard, uh, the evidence the committee 
uh, received was unanimous that instrumental tuition is an enriching element of any young person's education and is certainly not just about the facility uh, to play that instrument. The Music uh, Education Partnership Group summed it up in evidence uh, mentioning enhanced mental and physical health uh, along with transferable skills such as teamworking, resilience, discipline, problem solving, evaluating, abstract thinking and physical and fine motor coordination. They uh, and other uh, witnesses quoted neurological research in their support. But to be honest, uh, my own belief in the power of instrumental tuition to enrich springs from the rather more straightforward source uh, of my own experience with three daughters, all of whom learned an instrument at school and participated in wind bands uh, and youth orchestras. I spent a lot of hours, as it seems the uh, Cabinet Secretary does these days, listening to popular classical pieces uh, played, I have to be honest, with wildly varying skill. But I never doubted for a moment the benefit of participation for my daughters. Above all, it was clear to me how much fun they had taking part in music, although I suppose in hindsight I probably knew only the half of that fun and all the better uh, for that ignorance. If I was any doubt of that, then it was in any case eloquently argued, uh, as the convener has told us, both in the focus groups the committee held with young people and the powerful evidence given to the committee uh, by MSYPs Alice Ferguson and Catherine uh, Mackey. Now, all of this, uh, uh, when my daughters were studying instruments, was, of course, before I had the benefit of an MSP salary. But I was in a reasonably paid job, and yet I know that with three children, I would not have been able to afford this for all of them on the charging schemes that now exist in many local authorities. Only one of my three daughters actually studied music to higher and on to university level, but I'm no doubt that it was and that they would see it as a core part of school for all of them. And the truth is, I, I, I admit I'm as guilty as the next MSP in this, uh, that we spend too much time in debating our schools focus solely on exam attainment, uh, whether we're doing so to criticize school performance or to defend it, but not enough time recognizing that schools and education are about much more than that, uh, and that both sport and music opportunities out with the core exam curriculum should be part of that. And this was a core point of debate in the committee, and I think it remains uh, unresolved. There is clearly an argument that instrumental tuition outside study for SQA exams should fall under that heading of the adequate provision of a free education, a statutory responsible for local authorities. But of course, those authorities uh, and the Scottish Government contend that this is met by music lessons in the curriculum and that instrumental tuition is discretionary uh, and therefore extra. And I, I'm not sure that the Cabinet Secretary's statement this afternoon really added much clarity to that, but I do understand uh, that this interpretation is likely to be tested in court and that will certainly be an interesting judgment. The report does indeed conclude, uh, and I was pleased uh, to hear the Cabinet Secretary accept, accept this recommendation, that in principle instrumental tuition should be free. But I do agree with the report, and indeed with COSLA, that we cannot simply ignore the financial circumstances in which councils find themselves. As the COSLA briefing for this debate tells us, core council budgets have decreased in real terms by £1.64 billion since 2011-12. Councillor McCabe of COSLA was very clear in evidence to the committee. He said, the fundamental issue is not ring-fencing funding or protecting services. It is the chronic underfunding of local government over the past 10 years which the Parliament has presided over. Uh, and if I can be forgiven a kind of a partisan moment in a committee debate, I would remind uh, my friend and colleague, Councillor McCabe, that these benches have repeatedly sought to address that underfunding of councils in every budget over 10 years, but the government has failed to listen. Indeed, even the representatives of councils such as Glasgow, who, as the Cabinet Secretary said, have sustained free tuition, were clear about the financial difficulties they face in doing so. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I, I'm, uh, in the interest of uh, 
in the interest of a kind of decent tenor debate today, I'm going to pass by uh, Mr Gray's remarks about the Labour alternative budgets that we've experienced. I have some considerable experience of looking at Labour alternative budget positions and on many occasions they involved no increase in resources for local government. But can Mr Gray address the fact that in seven local authorities, local authorities are providing music, instrumental music, music tuition for free and that rather undermines his central argument that this is all about money. Ian Gray. But I think if Mr Swinney had been listening, he would have heard me say that the representative councillor Cunningham uh, of his, uh, the Cabinet Secretary's own party and of Glasgow, and of Glasgow, who have sustained free tuition, did make the point that in order to do so, they had to take extremely difficult financial decisions and he recognised uh, that the cuts to core funding in councils had made this difficult for other local authorities. My own council, East Lothian, which is very proud, no, which is very proud of the breadth, depth and quality of its musical traditions in schools, this year, face squeeze, facing squeezed budgets across areas such as social care, having to raise charges such as council house rents, felt that they had no option but to introduce charging, albeit with a generous scheme of discounts and bursaries. Now, my colleagues on the council know how disappointed I was at that decision, but I also have to understand the agonies that they went through in balancing a budget which is simply not adequate for the county's needs. Happily, in the case of East Lothian, early reports indicate there has not been the significant fall in take-up which the committee heard had happened uh, elsewhere. Personally, I would quite happily see instrumental tuition made free across Scotland through central government funding being made available specific, specifically to councils to achieve that. But that was not the recommendation of the committee as a whole, nor indeed the desire of COSLA, which does mean that the only possible way to fix the current postcode lottery of affordable access to instrument tuition is to once again provide proper, adequate core funding overall for our local councils. This is not about creating a nation of virtuosi. It is about enriching the educational experience of our young people and creating a nation of rounded, confident and fulfilled Scots, wherever they go to school or whatever their background. And I would argue, and I think the committee report makes this clear, that whatever the fiscal constraints or the desirability of local decision making, we have to try and find a way through to protect that. Thank you very much. And I now call on Ross Greer to open for the Green Party. Mr Greer, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I find this an incredibly interesting inquiry as one of only two people in my primary school who didn't even take up recorder at primary three. <laughs> I've learned quite a lot over the last few months. Um, it's uh, worth starting by saying that we have made some progress towards reducing inequality in our education system. As the First Minister highlighted last week, the attainment gap between those from the wealthiest and the poorest areas has by some measures narrowed a little, but there is still some way to go. In Scotland today, if you are from a more deprived background, the chances are you'll have fewer opportunities from, uh, than those from the more privileged backgrounds. The welcome fact that more pupils are attaining hires or going to university doesn't change the fact that deprivation continues to shape young people's lives in this country. People's hobbies, interests, their career choices, their self-development are all impacted by their socioeconomic background and that of their community. And to me, one of the most striking but unsurprising findings of our committee inquiry was that instrumental music tuition is one of the opportunities that pupils from less privileged backgrounds are increasingly missing out on. It's an area where inequality is growing. The huge growth in fees in music tuition, in some cases to more than £500 per instrument per child, mean that many young people are simply priced out of learning an instrument. Some of the most powerful evidence we received, as has already been mentioned, was from West Lothian Council, both from the council itself and from a local MSYP and musician. After a significant increase in fees in West Lothian saw a predictably significant drop-off in the number of pupils taking up an instrument, we found that that drop-off was overwhelmingly of pupils from less privileged backgrounds. That was an immediate and significant widening of inequality rather than a narrowing of it. And we've heard estimates of some 100,000 young people who want to learn an instrument, but feel or indeed are priced out of learning one. And with fees going up across the country, that number is likely to grow. It is growing. We've seen that even during the course of our inquiry, that number grew. With wages continuing to stagnate, still lower than they were before the financial crisis of a decade ago, and with the continuation of austerity, 
it's no surprise that there are many families in this country who can't afford hundreds of pounds of fees per child to learn an instrument. Alice Ferguson, the Linlithgow MSYP, who gave evidence to the committee, described this trend as a return to Victorian era levels of inequality. She could see that within her school. She could see pupils from more privileged backgrounds able to continue as part of the school orchestra, while those from more deprived backgrounds had to drop out. And this isn't just about instrumental music tradition alone. Learning about music as a subject is intertwined with learning an instrument. As the committee report highlights, learning to play an instrument is key to a better understanding of music education in the classroom. And the distinctions that we heard councils draw around fee exemptions in relation to those who take up music as a subject were in many cases simply unconvincing, particularly given the years of practice with their instrument, typically starting in primary school, which convinces many young people to take up music as an assessed subject once they reach the senior phase. Each local council has its own levels of fees and sets of concessions. Some provide instrumental uh, music tuition entirely free, as has been mentioned. Others uh, charge fees of up to uh, and over £500, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And while some do use fee income to subsidise the cost of providing free places, concession schemes, uh, etc., that doesn't ensure that all those who can't afford to access the service can do so. This is a perennial debate we have around means testing and universalism. We are familiar with these issues. They apply just as much here as they do in other areas. Now, as a supporter of local democracy and the equal legitimacy of any locally elected body to this one, I'm not convinced that a centralising move around uh, setting of fees or indeed of, of funding would be helpful. But given that, the onus is then on myself and on the Greens to propose our alternative solution, which I'll come to in a minute. But first, though, I'd like to raise a point which many witnesses made and which I think is important in the context of concessions and exemptions to fees. As the committee heard, it's often those families who fall just above the income threshold for support who are being squeezed out. These aren't wealthy families. Their incomes just aren't quite at the point where support would kick in. These are people very much deserving of support, but a threshold has to be set somewhere when these are the kind of structures that you set up. And I don't put the blame for this situation solely at the feet of local councils. I don't think any member here does. While I do question the decisions that some councils have made, and in particular the value or lack thereof that many councils are placing on music tutors in comparison to other staff, I recognise that councils have faced significant cuts since 2010. And while the Greens have worked to put additional funding back into local services, there's still a lot of work to be done. If we're even to get close to where we were a decade ago, Councils have faced cuts while having little power to raise their own revenue. Even after the end of the council tax freeze, there's still a cap set by the government on how much council tax can be varied, a cap that's subject to annual budget negotiations in this parliament. The Greens have been clear that councils not only need more money from central government to undo the austerity of the previous decade, they also need the power, the ability to raise their own revenue. Only then can they ensure that local services like music tuition are properly funded and open to all. I don't think any of us believe that there's an innate hostility within councils to the provision of instrumental music tuition. What came out of the evidence was a question of priorities. Some councils simply said to us that we either cut this service or increase fees in this service or we cut something else. We cut something in adult social care. We cut something in additional support needs. These are the incredibly um, unpopular decisions that councils have to make under the current financial situation. But I hope that we can move forward from this. I hope we can all recognise the indisputable benefits of music tuition and that tackling growing inequality should absolutely be a priority here in our parliament and in councils across Scotland. Thank you very much. And I call on Tabby Scott to open the Liberal Democrats. Mr Scott, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, no matter how many uh, and how long certain uh, long-suffering Shetland teachers tried, I was no star pupil when it came uh, to music. Frankly, the recorder was beyond me, uh, Mr Greer. So I am in awe of those who have uh, genuine uh, talent, real musical talent. Young people like 13-year-old uh, Ashley Hay, who won the Shetland Young Fiddler of the Year Award in Muriel in Lerwick on Saturday. Ten-year-old uh, Evie Williamson from Halsey, who won the Young Fiddler Junior and Traditional Junior Trophies. Uh, and Gracie Gowans Little, who was named the Intermediate Young uh, Fiddler Trophy winner. Uh, these uh, young people uh, have, have taken part in uh, Shetland's Young Fiddler of the Year awards. Awards have been going on since 1982, uh, and uh, the list of those who have won 
uh, over that period is a who's who, not just of Shetland traditional music, but of Scottish tr traditional music. Can I make some progress first? Um, uh, can I make some progress uh, first? Um, uh, if you'll forgive me, um, uh, I was uh, a, a few weeks ago. Uh, Mr. Allen, uh, Mr. McCarth, and I um, hosted a reception on uh, the islands, uh, and that evening we had uh, Chris Stout, Andrew Gifford, and Ross Cooper playing uh, for the assembled uh, company. Uh, all the the point about all these people is they went through the Shetland uh, educational system, and they were all part of Shetland individual musical uh, tuition. Uh, uh, lessons, uh, and uh, they are all uh, extra extremely uh, talented. Uh, the point about this debate for me, and the one that uh, others have to some extent reflect al already, is the best will always succeed. Those who've got that uh, talent, uh, Ashley Hay certainly has it, and she will have, if she wants, a glittering musical uh, career. She'll play to audiences not just at home in Shetland, but uh, mu much wider afield. Is they will succeed. They will make it through uh, the rough and tumble of the academic pursuit of the, their chosen uh, profession. Uh, but the, the, those who are not quite so gifted, those who are not quite so able, uh, will not. And the figures in the committee report uh, reflect uh, some uh, of that. So paying for that individual uh, tuition, as is now uh, happening, is also augmented by something that uh, no one has mentioned yet, and that's private tuition. And that raises in itself some, some challenges, not least of which, of course, for those who can't afford uh, to pay, for mums and dads who, who have enough pressures already. But the reality is that, um, that in, not just in my part of Scotland, but I know in many parts of Scotland, uh, private individual tuition, not just in traditional fiddle, but of course across the spectrum of musical choice, is, is now the reality for those who uh, absolutely uh, want to get on. And it's the wider picture that playing the fiddle along with the pipes, uh, singing, and of course the harp, were the basis uh, for this country's musical heritage long, long ago when uh, music mattered arguably more so than it does uh, to this day is, is why this debate is important. The fight to make sure the traditional fiddle uh, was taught in schools was led by a number of veritable Shetlanders who believed in the cultural significance of music, its importance to Shetland and indeed to Scotland, and that young people should have and be encouraged to play uh, the fiddle. The late Tom Anderson, for example, had to fight with the then SQA to have fiddle recognized as a national qualification, which makes me puzzled as to why today a grade seven SQA university entrance qualification, including a 25 minute performance, has now been downgraded to a grade five uh, uh, entrance qualification with a 15 minute uh, performance criteria. Does that say something about how we are progressing music uh, in our education system uh, today? Uh, traditional fiddle has had and now has formal musical grades and has had since 2003 as part of the strings and harp uh, syllabus. Uh, today, charging for individual tuition is reality, and Ian Gray is, of course, right. The only way forward on that is for a chunk of more money to be allocated from uh, somewhere. That analysis is uh, reasonable. But the consequence of that in Shetland and elsewhere uh, if, of charging uh, has meant an, a decline in the t both in the numbers taking um, uh, music or individual music uh, tuition, but also uh, and uh, allied to that has been the decline in time for the individual uh, lesson. Uh, I know that it's not just in Shetland where 45 minutes per lesson used to be allocated, it's now 25 minutes or some other variant uh, on that. Just ask teachers what that means in the teaching of uh, music. An advanced hire requires a 15 minute performance. If your average lesson is 25 minutes, how does even the best advanced hire uh, uh, music teacher make sure his or her pupils are ready for those exams? That means doing it out of class time. It means private tuition. It means many uh, other things. So I think there are questions not just about the charging regime, which others have very rightly raised today, but also about what's happening in, in our schools. To consider also the changes to school timetables. Uh, the lunch break is rather less than it was. Indeed, the lunch hour doesn't really exist in most schools, whether it's the asymmetric timetable or uh, other changes. So all those teachers who used to give their time to, to put on the kind of um, school orchestras and school performances that Ian Gray was mentioning in his remarks, 
finding it pretty difficult to fit that into uh, these times. So music, um, for me, a presiding officer, is Scotland. It is certainly uh, Shetland uh, as well. That appreciation of why music matters, if not nurtured and encouraged, has logical consequences because as young people become Scotland's future, uh, there will be less going to concerts, less involving uh, appreciating live performances, less buying uh, music. Scotland needs to remember our history and why music is part of that. And part of this debate is about that too. Thank you very much. Uh, open debate speeches of six minutes. Jenny Gilruth will be followed by Alison Harris. Ms Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I start by thanking the clerks to the Education Committee for all their help in uh, bringing together the committee's report and to all those who participated in giving evidence. Eight years ago, researchers at McGill University in Montreal established for the very first time that dopamine had been recorded in response to music. And dopamine transmission was higher when the participants were listening to music they enjoyed, which perhaps accounts for why my partner and I were listening to I Want to Break Free by Queen on the way into work this morning. Because, presiding officer, music makes us feel good. Under Curriculum for Excellence, there are eight broad curriculum areas, and as the Cabinet Secretary has mentioned, music is delivered through the expressive arts, which is grouped together with art and design, dance and drama. An instrumental music tuition, however, is separate from the teaching of music in class, so it is important to say that this is additional to the experiences and outcomes which children will already be taught. That being said, I think it is fair to say that almost, uh, it would be almost impossible to pass a qualification in music without tuition whether that was in school or out with uh, school time. That has to be considered within the current educational debate, which is centred strongly on equity, and I'm glad to hear the Cabinet Secretary confirm that no charges will apply to SQA uh, pupils for that reason. As Ian Gray has mentioned, the committee heard powerful evidence from young people, including two MSYPs, Alice Ferguson and Catherine Mackey. And Ms Mackey advised the committee that because of music tuition, I have become more resilient, confident and open-minded in everything that I do. From a mental health point of view, I have benefited from the creativity and feeling that I am part of a community, for example, part of a band. It's really good for my mental health. Indeed, as Councillor Chris Cunningham of Glasgow Council told us, part of the reason they have kept music tuition free is that it is recognised that music has wider benefits in terms of literacy, cognitive development and language development. The additional benefits that arise from it are those the core of why we regard it as important in the curriculum and why it has been regarded as so for years. But as we know in Scotland, 32 different local authorities can have 32 different approaches to delivering services. The committee heard evidence regarding a lack of uniformity in applying exemptions or concessions, with certain local authorities offering sibling discounts, for example. And Kirk Richardson, the convener of the EIS Instrumental Music Teacher Network, told the committee, I read in the Connect submission that the concessions are a minefield for parents. We have 32 variations of concessions. There are reasons why parents are not keen to fill in forms. I pressed COSLA on this point, particularly in relation to free school meal entitlement, and I was glad to hear that COSLA's uh, Children and Young People Board have agreed that free school meal entitlement is the minimum exemption criteria in all local authorities. However, when pressed on a view with regard to uniformity on exemptions, Councillor Stephen McCabe advised me, we simply represent the views of our members, it's not our job to tell our members what to do, and many councils expressed strong views on that issue. Presiding officer, this is the inherent tension for the committee's work, and it is a political point. That is, do we say that local authorities are democratically accountable to take decisions at a local level, the principle of localism? Or do we believe in principle that music tuition should be provided free of charge in every local authority? The committee was of the view that the latter was of greater importance, and on the point of equity, it is difficult to argue against this when some local authorities make music tuition free and others charge up to £524 a year to deliver it. Now, critics might argue that all children are entitled to music education through the expressive arts curriculum area, and I accept that argument. Nevertheless, if a child wants to progress to a qualification level, there is a strong argument that they will be disadvantaged if they do not have access to music tuition out with mainstream class hours time. Presiding officer, ahead of today's debate, I asked a member of my staff, who is significantly younger than I am, if she studied music when she was at school, and she told me no, that she had been told she wasn't good enough to study music at school. Which brings me neatly to the issue of a word which we don't like to talk about nowadays in education, and that is aptitude or ability. The committee heard evidence that it was still the case that councils uh, can still provide access to music tuition predicated on ability. 
And indeed, the latest Improvement Service survey records that 16 local authorities use some form of selection procedure or aptitude test for those wishing to undertake uh, instrumental music tuition. And as a result, the committee recommended that aptitude tests, which have a number of legitimate uses, should not be used as the sole basis for selecting pupils for instrumental music tuition and recommends that local authorities avoid doing so in the future. Now, when asked to respond to this point, COSLA advised there is no indication what secondary basis the committee is suggesting. It is possible that such an action would risk accusations of being inequitable if those of the most aptitude are overlooked. I think this response from COSLA is somewhat unhelpful. If pupils do not have the opportunity to try a musical instrument, how can they possibly develop an aptitude? Far from disadvantaging the most able, as argued by COSLA, the current system disadvantages those with least ability. And in many instances, those children would have the least access to music out with school if parents cannot afford private tuition, for example. Presiding officer, in summing up, music tuition in school is an experience which many young people across the country continue to enjoy, in addition to their core studies in music through the expressive arts. Notwithstanding the various levels of charges and exemptions which are often applied inconsistently can mean that some children will miss out. I very much hope that COSLA will consider their role seriously in addressing how this inequality can be rectified to benefit the musical talents of all of Scotland's pupils. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I call Alison Harrison and I, members, if you want to speak in a debate, uh, as a preliminary, it's a good idea to press your request to speak button. I'll not say who it is. I call Alison Harris, be followed by Tom Arthur. It wasn't <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And for the record, I had pressed my button, so it wasn't me. <laughs> but may I say how pleased I am to be speaking in this debate. The subject of the debate addresses something close to my own heart. When I think of the joy that learning to sing and play music has brought to my own family, I have witnessed firsthand the benefits that music tuition can bring to children. Therefore, I am deeply concerned by the growing trend of charging for the provision of instrumental music tuition. George Kelly, former head of instrumental music services at Eastern Bartonshire Council, recently said, there is no other single activity which can have such a profound effect on men, as many areas of development as learning to play an instrument. It's a skill that lasts a lifetime. Instrumental music tuition can also lead to diverse social development, allowing children to make new friends thanks to the extensive list of extracurricular activities that goes with it. We've also got to consider the advantages for the wider society and economy too. Kirk Richardson from the EIS highlighted to committee that Scotland currently makes up 11% of the UK's live music revenue. He pointed out that music tourism tops up Scotland's economy by £280 million a year and supports more than 2,000 full-time jobs. This didn't happen overnight. Generations of Scottish children have grown up learning to play instruments, all contributing to our society. The benefits extend far beyond the realm of music in schools, and I know the committee has acknowledged this in their report. However, while music education is a part of the core curriculum, instrumental music tuition is not. This is why I am so concerned about charging. From 2016-17 to 2017-18, there was a fall of almost 1,300 children learning to play an instrument. This coincided with increases in the level of fees for tuition. As we have already heard, councils like Glasgow and Edinburgh provide instrumental music tuition to pupils for free. Clackmannanshire, less than 40 miles away from either, is now charging £524 for a year of music tuition and that equates to roughly £14 per school week. And this is double the level they charged last year. Equity is a defining principle of the Curriculum for Excellence, but this is quite clearly not being represented in instrumental music tuition. The cost is, of course, a problem for many parents. Despite this, though, many councils charge for instrumental tuition, and we're hearing that several local authorities are, in fact, increasing their fees. I realise that these decisions are not taken lightly, but they have serious consequences. These charges affect those from the most deprived backgrounds. I, you know, I do acknowledge that systems are in place to provide tuition for disadvantaged children, 
But as Kirk Richardson from the EIS also pointed out, these tend to come attached with a stigma, and thus children who are eligible are not coming forward, creating an instrumental musical attainment gap. Elsewhere, Councillor Dodds from West Lothian spoke of an 80% fall in the number of primary school children taking up music tuition since the council began charging this year. John Wallace, chair of the Scottish Government's Music Education Partnership Group, spoke about Clackmannanshire's situation, saying that large slices of local culture, like the Clackmannan District Brass Band, will disappear in the future. Families have written to councils. The EIS have warned of dramatic falls in the number of music teachers. There has been a 42% fall in the number of dedicated primary school music teachers since 2011. This picture is bleak. I would like to say that I share the committee's concern that if there is no action on this, the flow of talent from Scotland's schools into bands, orchestras, and indeed back into education as teachers themselves will suffer in the coming years and decades. Subject choice is narrowing, and I know that's actually tomorrow's debate, but with subject choice narrowing, the arts are often one of the first to go. I think it is therefore important that we ask ourselves what kind of education system we are building. Will we ignore our leading musicians who have contributed greatly to Scotland's culture and have benefited vastly from instrumental music tuition, yet they are the ones who are warning that the situation is worse than ever before? Will Scotland become a country where all children take the same four or five subjects at higher, where they do not play instruments because tuition is too expensive? where our music and art teachers are no longer needed or wanted. That's not a Scotland I want to see. And it's not a Scotland that needs to become a reality. But Deputy Presiding Officer, if we let these charges and the variation across the country continue, I'm afraid this is a Scotland we're going to get. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Tom Arthur, who followed by Claire Baker. Mr Arthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to take part in this debate. I should begin by reminding members that I'm a member of the Musicians' Union. I was previously a freelance music tutor, and I'm also a convener of the cross-party group in music. It is a, a bittersweet experience to take part in this debate. It's sweet because it gives me an opportunity to talk about music, but unfortunate that the, this excellent inquiry undertaken by the Education and Skills Committee has been prompted by what are legitimate and serious concerns regarding the provision of instrumental music services across Scotland. And I want to put on record my thanks to the committee for producing this very considered, thoughtful and serious piece of work. I also want to recognise the contribution of all those who gave evidence, both orally and written submissions to the committee, and in particular to the EIS and the Music Education Partnership Group, who have had the pleasure, pleasure of engaging with um, at the cross-party group in music, where the question of ed music education and instrumental services has now become a, a standing item on the agenda. There's a number of themes that are, I think are emerging in this debate and our deliberations. One is between local and national responsibility. Another is between the instrumental and the intrinsic value of music. And one is between music education and instrumental education. And I would like to, time permitting, take each one in turn. On the question of local or national, I think there are very legitimate and understandable points made by COSLA and local authorities. And I understand that they face difficult decisions, decisions that as well as being difficult in, in purely budgetary terms can be politically difficult as well, given the multifarious demands and competition for resources placed on them. But the point I would wish to echo is that made by the Cabinet Secretary which, which is that local authorities in different parts of Scotland, including in Renfisher in my own constituency, have demonstrated that they are capable of delivering instru music, uh, instrumental music services without a charge. And I think what can be learned from that is that it is possible, and I would hope other local authorities would look and would engage with Renfisher and Glasgow City and other local authorities to understand how they have been able to deliver this service. Now, I, I respect local democracy, and I would not wish to see the imposition 
of uh, a national music agency which would undermine that, though I do uh, await with interest the outcome of the legal case that's ongoing with regards to the 1980 Act, because I, I personally do see, um, and I say this from the very subjective point of view, instrumental education as part of the core curriculum and indeed as part of music education. I do not believe instrumental music tuition can be separated from music education any more than physical activity can be separated from physical education within a high school or primary setting for that matter. I believe that where all PE to consist of, we are to be watching sport or discussing sport, then people would legitimately say that was not physical education. And I think very much the same applies to instrumental education as well and music education. Music education, historiography, composition, um, listening skills are all very important, but it is part of a broader holistic approach. The ultimate endeavour in all forms of musical education is to be able to perform and play and there are many disciplines and I say that as someone who has studied musicology and who did a master's degree in composition which feed towards that but I think for any common sense definition of what music is it is a process of listening to that oral phenomena it is of attending a concert or any sort of music making event and to suggest that the actual art of performing can somehow be separate I do not really think is a sustainable position. Now, the final point I want to come to is a dis distinguishing, is a, what I think is one of the most contentious issues, and it's one I struggle with, which is the instrumental and the intrinsic value of music. Now, for many policymakers, and particularly trying to persuade a sceptical audience, we will often adduce the various additionalities brought through music education. Many of them have been articulated this afternoon. Many are articulated, articulated in the report by the committee and many are indeed articulated in the, in the what's going on now report by the Music Education Partnership Group and indeed in the Change the Tune Instrumental Charter from the EIS and they are all very valid arguments but fundamentally if the only argument for instrumental music services is that it can improve attainment in other areas then it does leave open the possibility in future that should some better means be identified, then that would vitiate the argument. No longer would there be an argument for mu instrumental music services if these results, if these outcomes could be achieved by alternative means. So that's why I think it is incredibly important that we continue to argue for the intrinsic value of music as something that enriches us. I have found that perhaps one of the most uh, powerful accounts of, of the value of music I ever heard was in reading um, an account given by a palliative care nurse and it was in the reflections of people at the end of their life and what the regrets would be and the regrets were I wish I'd had a bigger car I wish I'd spent more hours at work it was things such as I wish I'd spent more time with my family I wish I'd learned a language and I wish I'd learned to play a musical instrument and I think giving a young person the gift of the ability to play a musical instrument is something they will take for the rest of their lives and I don't think there's any more beautiful or worthwhile gift our educators can give. And I believe that's why we should support instrumental music services and instrumental music tuition for all young people in Scotland. Thank you, Mr Arthur. I call Claire Baker, be followed by Rona Mackay, the speaker, please. Um, thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to take part in this afternoon's debate and I thank the committee for all their work in producing this report. The provision of instrumental music tuition is an issue which Parliament has considered a number of times, but recent reports show the service is under greater pressure than ever before. Budgetary pressures on local authorities mean councils are facing difficult choices year after year. Every year, instrumental music tuition comes up in budget proposals in my region, and I'm sure it's the same across Scotland. In the past year, Clark Manager in my region has increased the fee to £524 a year, the highest in Scotland. This annual uncertainty is a huge pressure for those employed in the profession, and it's not fair on pupils and their families each year facing uncertainty as to what instrument... I, I'm really pushed for time, but brief. Stuart McMillan. I thank Claire Baker for taking intervention. Will Claire Baker accept that budget pressures are not a new phenomenon? It's something that's been around for many, many years, even prior to the SNP government. Claire Baker. Um, I'm afraid I, I wouldn't accept that. I feel that in recent years, local authorities have faced greater and greater pressure. And I think, as others have described, there is a tipping point within this service this year. Um, the consequences of these pressures risk the viability of the service. 
The financial pressure on local authorities mean they face difficult choices and the status of instrumental music tuition leaves it vulnerable. And the underlying problem won't be resolved until local authorities receive a fair share of Scottish Government funding. The committee report does recommend that school music services should continue to be managed locally and they do raise questions over how to ensure equity of access across Scotland. Individual circumstances should not be a barrier to instrumental music tuition, but it is the case that not all households will be able to afford this additional expense. While concessions are welcome, they are not consistent across authorities and means testing is pretty blunt. A family on a low income will often be liable to pay fees, which in many areas have become unrealistic. If we look at the view of music professionals, research by the Musicians' Union has found families with household incomes under £28,000 are half as likely to have a child learning an instrument than those on a family income of over £48,000 or more. 41% of lower income families say that lessons are out with household budgets. The same report also looked at the benefits of learning a musical instrument with positive impacts on confidence, concentration, self-discipline, patience and even overall happiness as a result of attending music lessons. These wider benefits should be better promoted and understood, so decisions on music education are seen as much more than figures on a balance sheet. Instrumental music teachers can be left in a position of underemployment if reduced uptake is a consequence of fees. This job insecurity leads to them suffering low morale and stress on an annual basis. We need to be encouraging our future musicians and music teachers, not having them question the viability of their career path. Underemployment of instrumental music teachers could also impact on participation in orchestras and other ensembles. It could also mean pupils being taught in larger groups, which in some instances can offer tuition at a lesser cost, and we do see some local authorities adopting this position, but it can result in reduced quality for pupils. In February this year, I had the opportunity to visit the Royal Conservatoire. In February, along with other partners, the RSC launched What's Going On, a new study examining music education. The report explored formal, informal and non-formal sections of music education in Scotland, finding music was among the most popular subject on the Scottish curriculum and arguing that more needs to be done to ensure understanding of its value to individuals and the economy. In its submission to the committee inquiry, the RCS stressed the time it takes to learn a musical instrument to the level required for the conservatoire. Instrumental tuition has to begin at an early age, well before free tuition is available by the means of studying for an SQA. The submission sets out that by the age kind of 8 or 10, a child who cannot access tuition due to fees will simply not be able to demonstrate the skill level required for entry in 10 years' time. By not providing free instrumental tuition at an early stage, we are potentially preventing students from being able to reach the level required without either paying for fees or employing private tuition. Entry to the RCS also requires performance of a piano piece as part of admission to its undergraduate teacher training programme, but not all local authorities are actually providing instrumental tuition in piano, further limiting opportunities for pupils. I have previously raised questions over widening access to the Conservatoire and I welcome the work they are undertaking to improve access. But when it comes to music, the role of affordable, accessible, instrumental music tuition can't be underestimated as a way to increase access and opportunity. The committee report welcomes continued support for the Youth Music Initiative as a means for introducing young people to music at an early age, recommending consideration of extending it or introducing a new initiative. This is a key point. The YMI allows a high number of young pupils to experience music making, but doesn't provide any means for continuing participation. It offers a limited number of hours without a further option for musical experience, unless you are selected for instrumental music tuition and can then afford it. Instrumental tuition should be a necessary continuation of the YMI experience and much more should be done to build on it. Um, a briefing from EIS argues that investment in projects like the YMI, though valuable, cannot replace instrumental music teaching. It does serve as a taster, but there needs to be greater consideration given to how to build on it, and I'd be interested in the Minister's comments on this in closing. Just a final brief point. Um, the EIS do say that the importance, long-term impact of the economy and culture is important, and that's an important aspect of the debate which shouldn't be overlooked. 
The UK is recognised as a cultural leader and our music industry is a significant part of that. It is part of our identity and our performers are recognised across the world. And yet music and the performing arts are at risk of becoming a profession only for those who can afford to take up these opportunities. This would make our cultural life poorer and we must work with our local authority partners to ensure instrumental music tuition remains a gateway for these opportunities for all young people. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Rona Mackay, followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Ms Mackay, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Music is fundamental to people of all ages and backgrounds. Few of us can imagine a world without music. That's why the Education Committee inquiry into instrumental music tuition in schools entitled A Note of Concern, the future of instrumental music tuition in schools, was so important. Because it is a huge concern that fewer children will have the benefit of learning to play an instrument while at school. In my view, an essential part of their educational journey. Teaching young people who want to learn how to play an instrument is a fundamental part of their learning, which boosts their creativity, confidence and holistic well-being. A 2016 study on music and attainment found that young people aged 11 to 16 who played an instrument showed greater progress and better academic outcomes than those not playing, with the greatest impact for those playing the longest. In addition, for young people with additional support needs, music is an excellent therapy. I first learned of the Nordroff Robbins music therapy in the 80s and the fantastic work it's done over the decades. Nordroff Robbins Scotland worked with people from ages 1 to 100 and in 2017 delivered over 5,000 music therapy sessions across a range of settings throughout central Scotland, including schools, community settings and their centres in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee and Fife, helping individuals with physical, emotional, cognitive and social needs. Many third sector and community groups also offer music as a therapy for ex-offenders, recovering addicts and young people experiencing mental health problems, such as Kirk and Tillich's rookie rock stars in my constituency of Strathkelvin and Bears Den. Presiding officer, the benefit of music as a therapy and of playing a musical instrument is beyond doubt, and all the evidence is there to support it. So what is the problem we're facing in our schools today? As we've heard from the convener, most but not all local authorities have introduced charges for instrumental music tuition. And this has had a drastic effect on the uptake of learning to play an instrument. Despite siblings' subsidies and the complexities uh, of them, as Jenny Goruth pointed out, uh, the cost is simply out of reach for their budget, and this must surely increase inequity in the classroom. My own local authority in Eastern Bartonshire, run by a Tory Lib Dem coalition, now charges £230 for tuition, increased from £177 in the last budget. Happily, the excellent Douglas Academy Music School, which is in my neighbouring constituency of Mogai, is free to students on application, and it's flourishing. The other factor to consider is the chicken and egg situation, which the convener mentioned where the, the less uh, children being afforded music tuition means the less teachers are needed, creating an ever-decreasing circle of supply and demand. The committee believes parents and carers need to be fully informed about the cost for instrumental music tuition and associated costs for participation in music opportunities such as school or local authority bands who have always played such a big part in communities. Of course, no local authority introduces these charges lightly, but everything possible should be done to eliminate or mitigate charges, and there must be consistency across local authorities to do away with postcode lottery advantages and disadvantages. Presiding officer, the committee believes for all the beneficial reasons I mentioned earlier that music tuition should be provided free of charge in every local authority. We've heard the stats. Some local authorities don't charge, but the majority do, and this is... Uh, demonstrating that it's a, an entirely a political or a prioritised choice. It seems to depend on how much value individual local authorities put on instrumental music tuition. Should it be regarded as a luxury subject or should it be viewed as part of the core curriculum? Of course, there are differing views regarding the status of this. To have instrumental music tuition in the core curri curriculum would have pra practical implications. But I believe, and the committee believes, that the benefits would far outweigh negative consequences of such a decision. <coughs> Presiding officer, Scotland has a rich heritage of musical excellence, as Tavish Scott uh, mentioned, from folk and country music to talent, to traditional and rock music, and our amazing roll call of talented, world-renowned singer-songwriters, actually too many of them to mention. Anyone who's been at the excellent Celtic Connections annual music fest or any of the wonderful festivals around the country, such as Belladrum or Transmit, to name just a couple, will know that music is an integral part of our society. 
We're also home to the world-renowned Royal Conservatoire Centre of Excellence. And as we've heard, the committee heard compelling evidence from tutors there regarding their concern about the future of instrumental music tuition. I'm proud that in my own constituency, young singer-songwriter Katie Cross and her band The Amberjacks are fast-rising stars of the country music scene worldwide. Katie's father runs Bishop Briggs School of Music and it's going from strength to strength with hundreds of youngsters queuing up to learn and expand their instrumental skills. The value of music to children simply cannot be overstated. So in conclusion, presiding officer, music tuition, tuition must play a, concor, a core part in young people's development. It's not a luxury or a bonus subject. It enhances the creativity and rounded education of our next generation, and it should be nurtured, not neglected. Thank you very much. I call Gordon Lindhurst to be followed by Alistair Allen. Mr Lindhurst, please. Deputy presiding officer, as a member of the cross-party group on music, with a lifelong interest in instrumental music myself, I'm delighted to be able to speak in today's debate. As a child, I cannot remember a time when instrumental music did not play a part in the life of our family. My father played the violin and my mother the organ, and they both played the piano, uh, sometimes even at the same time. So it was not surprising that I took piano lessons from a young age. Our piano teacher, Miss Stevenson, was a pianist of concert standard. She could tell simply by the sound if the wrong finger had been used on a piano key. Given that she was blind from birth, it was just a small example of her incredible talent as a pianist herself. So music has had a positive and enjoyable influence in my own life, and I am keen, as are other members here today, to facilitate the introduction of the young people of today to music. Here in the Parliament, I've had the privilege of inviting St. Mary's Music School in Edinburgh to the Scottish Parliament to play in the garden lobby. And having seen these groups of students play, I know that we have a lot to celebrate in Scotland when it comes to musical talent. And yet the report we debate today from the Education and Skills Committee paints a rather gloomy picture at times. One where there is a real postcode lottery in music tuition offering greater opportunity in some areas than others, where family income plays a key role sometimes in deciding who gets to play an instrument and who doesn't, and where there is opportunity, staffing pressures diluting the education that is being delivered. The introduction of hefty charges for music tuition gives cause for concern when we look at the numbers dropping out as a result. We heard in the report about the example of West Lothian in my region, where following the introduction of charges, numbers of primary students in tuition fell from 1,128 in 2017 to 234 in 2018. In that case, charging was agreed upon at local authority level in order to avoid the next worst scenario of losing some instrumental tuition altogether. Indeed, over half of parents agreed with some form of charging in order to save planned cuts to string and percussion. Nevertheless, that huge drop off in the numbers of students taking tuition tells us that the 340 pound charge is out of sync with what many parents can actually afford. And yet local authorities are having to make these difficult decisions in the face of drastic cuts enforced upon them by this SNP government. 1.64 billion pounds in core funding in real terms since 2011 to 12. Certainly. Cabinet Secretary. I, I would like Mr Lindhurst to explain to me what the Conservative input to the budget process this year would have done to improve local authority finances. Gordon Lindhurst. I think, as uh, Mr Swinney knows, it's a question of priorities and what one focuses on and what one puts the funding towards. Returning, returning, to the report, returning to the report before Parliament, as COSLA stated in its response, no local authority introduces these charges lightly. We heard, of course, about examples of local authorities setting their own exemptions and concessions, which are welcome, such as an exemption of fees for children who are in receipt of free school meals across the board. But as often happens and as some witnesses highlighted, it is those families 
just above the thresholds for exemptions who sometimes suffer the most. An anonymous teacher put it quite starkly by explaining that for some families who don't qualify for an exemption, it can often come down to whether to pay a fuel bill or pay for instrumental lessons. That is a choice, Deputy Presiding Officer, that parents should not have to make, especially when considering the wider benefits that a curriculum involving music can deliver for a child. Improving motor skills, mental agility, self-evaluation and listening skills amongst others. We've heard about the number of dedicated music teachers working in Scotland's primary schools falling by some 42% in the last seven years, which puts a huge strain on those who are left, causing shortened lessons, busier classes, reduction of one-to-one -one time with a teacher, and the dilution of specialism amongst music tutors. The profession can see itself sometimes as the so-called low-hanging fruit, most at risk of the reality of council cuts, and the statistics and experiences of pupils would appear to bear that out. Deputy Presiding Officer, instrumental music tuition needs to be recognized for the role it can play in raising attainment rather than simply as an add-on. And as local authorities struggle to cope with an ever-reducing pot of funding, its tuition becomes ever more vulnerable. And I hope that the government will reflect on that in today's debate and come up with a clear course of action for the future, realizing, as I think we do in this chamber, that the future of Scottish music as a cornerstone of our culture is at stake. Thank you. I call Alistair Allen, who will be followed by Daniel Johnson. Mr. Allen, please. President Officer, uh, those who gave evidence to the Education and Skills Committee left it in no doubt about the transfer transforming effect which music can have on young people's lives and the need to ensure that this experience remains accessible to all. In my own constituency, I can certainly recognise the vast amount of work which is undertaken um, by a small number of music teachers and tutors and largely it should be said uh, for free in the islands. Uh, and without them, it would be difficult to see how the Western Isles could make the huge contribution which it does to the MOD, Fish Movement, Musician of the Year competition, school pipe bands, and I could go on. And across Scotland, music is a strong and essential player in our culture, uh, whether it is, as we've heard, in Shetland's fiddling tradition, or indeed that of Speyside, or Peabroch, or Scots Song, or the silver bands of our former mining communities, or Glasgow's choral tradition. It's difficult to see how any of this can be sustained, however, uh, if young people don't get the opportunity to be part of these musical experiences. So musical instrumental tuition is key to ensuring that these diverse traditions continue to prosper. The committee heard how all forms of musical education can benefit children and young people in many ways, uh, including through positively uh, impacting on wider attainment. Now, presenting officer, decisions about instrumental music tuition are made by each local authority. The committee recognised that it is important uh, that there is local democracy, that councils have the freedom to make their own decisions on this. However, I hope that when making these kinds of decisions, uh, local authorities might reflect on the position of the committee uh, and indeed, more importantly, uh, on the position of local communities across Scotland uh, who contacted the committee about this. I hope, for instance, that they will recall the commitments which they as local authorities gave in uh, 2013 to avoid the excessive variation uh, in fees across the country that we have seen of late. And one central issue which the committee had to face was whether all of Scotland's local authorities are actually living up to these commitments in practice. Music as a subject in schools is, of course, being taught across the country. But the fundamental question, and other members have, have pointed to this, is whether all young people get uh, access to the instrumental tuition that they will realistically need at an early stage to stand much chance of doing a course like advanced higher music. Certainly they will probably need that tuition if they want to become actively musical for the rest of their lives with all of the benefits that we've heard that that brings. And yet the picture on the ground in many areas stands in contrast to the commitment which those uh, local authorities gave six years ago uh, that instrumental tuition necessary for SQA qualifications would not be charged for. 
The picture on this and other issues varies dramatically across the country. While local authorities generally make free provision for children in receipt of school meals, beyond that, there are a large group of children for, whom, uh, for whose parents, rather, the costs charged by some authorities often make musical tuition simply unaffordable. We saw recently how Midlothian Council uh, announced in their budget that they intended to slash free tuition. The subsequent uh, campaign saw contributions from artists across Scotland, including Karen Polworth, as well as, uh, of course, valiant work uh, from local MSPs, forcing the local authority there into reversing those plans. But their decisions to reverse that decision was, of course, very welcome. Uh, and I hope that the work of the campaign for free music tuition serves as an example to other local authorities about the strength of feeling that exists on this subject. Presiding officer, I, I understand uh, the, the pressures under which local authorities work just now. We've heard about it. Uh, just as there are, although it's rarely acknowledged by some parties, pressures on the Scottish Government itself uh, faced uh, with the consequences as it is of Tory austerity from Westminster. However, I believe that some authorities have failed to recognise a central point. Some councils are in fact rationing instrumental tuition to the point where the opportunities of a career in music are being seriously restricted for many young people. On the committee, we heard a fear expressed by some students at the Royal Conservatoire, for instance, that in some parts of the country, the prospects of a young person qualifying to become a music teacher are in fact becoming very seriously restricted on grounds of social background. If a career in teaching maths uh, were ever to be socially restricted in that way, we would, uh, I think, uh, be asking some pretty searching questions. And I also had an email just this morning from one music teacher in Scotland uh, very strongly rejecting the, uh, the excuse, I have to call it, put forward by some local authorities uh, in the form of the discretionary argument. Uh, the argument that these are discretionary areas uh, of education, not, not areas uh, which local authorities are compelled in any way to provide. Uh, and, and this music teacher merely pointed out that, out that if we were to apply that argument consistently, we would have to say there was no obligation to teach anything legally in Scotland schools other than RE. Uh, and he very strongly put the point that that was a red herring which uh, this parliament uh, had to reject. Anyway, the, the Deputy First Minister has made very clear the Scottish Government aims to work collaboratively to find solutions to help uh, ensure instrumental music does remain accessible to all, and I very much welcome the efforts um, that have been uh, made uh, between the Government and local authorities in this to date. But meanwhile, it's important for this Parliament to recognise uh, today the huge contribution that music tuition makes to the lives of children and young people in our country, uh, and I hope that the committee's report leaves that much beyond any doubt. Daniel Johnson, followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And I, I too would like to thank the committee for bringing forward this debate because I think it, it speaks to a, a very important topic uh, within education, which is about the breadth of education that we deliver and actually indeed what the meaning of education is. And I'd like to begin with something of a personal insight. Since the summer, um, most evenings I have been picking up my guitar which had been much neglected for, for about 10 years or so and most evenings these days I, I do uh, play a little bit. Now I give that as an example not of what can be achieved through music tuition as because most people who have heard my guitar playing would uh, probably uh, conclude that the reverse is true and there's a deficit of tuition uh, in my uh, uh, particular example. But more, uh, the reason I give this example is because I have found that it has improved my well-being. It has replaced what I'm, uh, activities such as watching TV in the evening with something which I think has really improved my stress levels and my overall mental health. And the importance of this, I think, is while many uh, speakers have spoken to the importance of uh, the cultural contribution in terms of learning music or wider benefits such as confidence or community, I think if we look to that broader definition of education, that ability um, that, that music can provide, uh, both in terms of one's capacity, but I think in particular uh, in terms of uh, 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 mental health and well-being, are quite considerable. So I think the, the points that Tom Arthur, and I noticed he's no longer in the chamber, but also Liz Smith raised about those wider definitions of education 
are incredibly important. So through that teacher who said that mu music was non-essential, I say it is an absolutely essential life skill. And if we're serious about tackling that, those broader senses of well-being in, in uh, our young people, I think music can play a critical part. But that part that it can play goes much uh, more broadly than simply, I think, uh, life skills and, and uh, well-being. There is a, deg a considerable degree of science uh, that now lies behind the benefits of uh, music. Um, uh, for, for, and I think we all know that to be true. From the simple insight of uh, using a, a mnemonic or a little tune to memorize a fact is a much more effective way of memorization. But increasingly, neuroscience is showing that actually music has a much more profound impact on our uh, neural pathways and our gray matter, that music improves memory, IQ, coordination, and concentration. In a decade-long US study, they, they found that with pronounced academic uh, performance improvements through music tuition. Likewise, executive function is improved. In psychological science, there was a, an article showing that task switching was improved, which is critical to executive function, that ability to decide what task to, to uh, tackle at the right time. And indeed, in terms of my own, one of my own particular areas of interest in terms of neurodevelopmental orders, it's precisely this insight that music, much like practicing gymnastics, dance, or, or indeed martial arts, improves coordination and improves executive function through that repetitive and controlled behavior that there are much wider and profound impacts than simply the activity itself. Now, this is why I think it's of profound concern, uh, the evidence of uh, uh, cuts and uh, withdrawal of free music tuition. Now, I have heard a number of people uh, mention that in a number of local authorities that local authorities have uh, continued to maintain few free tuition. Indeed, Edinburgh is one of those such areas. Now, I don't know about other members' local areas, but I know in Edinburgh every single year for the last few years, that free music tuition has been under threat. It has been one of the cuts that the council has been forced to look at, one that's been looking at its, its uh, uh, very much stretched uh, resources. But it would be a mistake. I mean, I, I think uh, uh, members have pointed to the importance of exam preparation. Simply providing music tuition in the final years as someone leads up to the other is simply insufficient. If we judge the ability of someone to uh, gain true mastery of any skill is around 10,000 hours. 20 hours in a single academic year is a drop in the ocean of what is needed. But there is, I think, a more fundamental and more profound equality issue at heart. And I think Ross Greer, I think, outlined that excellently. That quite simply, both in terms of geography, but I think also uh, socioeconomic circumstances, this withdrawal of free music tuition has a profound uh, impact, meaning that there is a, a, a deeply unequal distribution of people being able to obtain music tuition. That quite simply, £500 a year is too much for too many people. And the reality is, is that many families will recognise the benefits of music tuition and will continue to make it available. And so therefore these withdrawals will create an, an, a profoundly iniquitous uh, situation for children across Scotland. One that will affect their opportunities, one that will affect their performance and progress at school, and one which will deprive them of what I think is a, a vital and important life skill. But fundamentally, we cannot look at this topic without looking at the subject of local government finance. The reality is, since 2010, uh, spend per pupil in primary schools has reduced by £427 per pupil. In secondary schools, that's £265 per pupil, uh, an almost 8% and 4% uh, reduction, respectively. As there's been an overall 7% reduction in the proportion of government funding that has been given to local government. And then when you consider that a third of local authority spend goes on education, the only consequence, the, the only thing that will happen are cuts such as this to non-core spend such as music tuition. And that is the thing that we all have to consider this afternoon. Thank you. Stuart McMillan, followed by Rachel Hamilton. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, at the outset, I actually want to thank my colleagues uh, across the Chamber for their, uh, for their hard work, certainly, and their support, but also for the contributions uh, this afternoon. But I want to touch upon just uh, kind of one brief point to the Labour Party colleagues uh, in the Chamber before I go on to actually discussing the report. It's just it's regarding this issue of uh, local government finance. And it has been stated already by colleagues that uh, obviously 
There are challenging times. Nobody can deny that. But at the same time, this is not a new issue. And I'm going to give you a wee quote. It's a quote from a, it was a councillor, Robert Jackson. Councillor Jackson was the leader of Inverclyde Council uh, in the early 2000s. And this is what he said in 2002. And this is when Inverclyde Council was faced with a £4 million budget shortfall. And this is what he said. He said, this is standard procedure. And I am confident that officers will come up with recommendations to address this. We are dealing with it as we do every year. Now, the challenge of local government finance is not new. It's not something that happened from 2007 onwards, despite what some politicians in the chamber might actually want to say. But it's not new. It has been an issue for many, many years. Now, now I'm going to touch upon uh, the actual report now, uh, presenting also. And that's, uh, so this report, I, I generally found the report very useful and very, uh, very helpful uh, in understanding uh, and trying to understand uh, many of the various issues that have been raised. And, and the report does actually highlight the importance of music tuition both individually and also nationally for our pupils. And I firmly agree that learning a musical instrument is of great benefit to every single person involved. Not solely because of, as Tom Arthur said earlier, not solely because of the other things that it will bring, but actually because of what music can do for an individual themselves. Now, every member uh, in the chamber who's spoken thus far actually understands the importance of music tuition. And I know the Scottish Government is committed to preserving instrumental music tuition and also values the contribution of all music teachers and instrumental music in instructors in our schools. And I also know that music teachers in schools uh, never fail to impress me with their talent and also their absolute abundant energy uh, and enthusiasm to teach music to, to, to pupils year in, year out. Now, I, I remember Mrs McCrory, uh, my music teacher, uh, when I went to Port Glasgow High School. Uh, and and I, I, mean, I, I, still, I still see Mrs McCrory out and about in my constituency uh, and, and I thank her for everything that she attempted to do with me. Um, she wasn't teaching me the pipes. I learned the pipes outside of school. And this is a, an aspect that's not been touched upon uh, in the debate thus far. Not every person who learns a musical instrument learns it in school. There are many people who learn outside. I learned the, the bagpipes in the Boys Brigade. Uh, there's also the Scouts. Uh, there are the Army Cadets and many other organisations where people can actually learn a musical instrument. And thankfully, over the years, as touched upon uh, within my contribution to Liz Smith earlier, uh, there has been, certainly when it comes to bagpipes, there has been a change over the years in terms of the, uh, tying in the, the piping uh, in, instructing, instruction sorry, with the SQA. Uh, so that is going to certainly help going forward. Uh, and, and this is a point that, uh, that I just think, I accept that this committee's uh, piece of work wasn't about external school tuition. Uh, but uh, I just want to make sure that people are aware that uh, people learn musical instruments not solely through school. Uh, and there will be many people who, uh, who, will, uh, who will follow this debate uh, and they will, they will accept that particular point. Now, I want to touch upon a few of the, of the, the sections uh, of the, the report. Uh, section 9 and 20 uh, suggests that music education benefits young people. It raises their self-confidence. And the sections 11 and 17 say they can actually play that pivotal role in improving people's attainment in the mental health and social skills. Absolutely true. And also, uh, it must be recognised in sections 25 and 27, uh, they suggest that there are a differing views regarding whether the status of music tuition is discretionary or part of that core curriculum. And the section 30 suggests specialist tutors, a diverse range of instruments and sufficient level of teaching time is needed uh, in order to present uh, for SQA examinations. And I also recognise that as per section 75, that with the introduction of charging for lessons, there has been a significant drop in participation levels in music tuition. This is where the, the aspect of the various local authorities who have stopped their charging uh, is certainly beneficial, and I warmly welcome that. Uh, there was another point that uh, I want to touch upon, and that's the, uh, the issue, uh, it was in uh, section 106, and that's the issue of the attitude tests. For many people, music or sport is actually the route out of poverty. It's the route to a better life. And it's the route to actually having a better uh, opportunity to actually uh, put more into society. Uh, and the issue of having aptitude tests, uh, I think, is wrong. I think it's fundamentally wrong. And, and I do welcome the, uh, the recommendation in the report. Uh, and, but, but I would actually go stronger than that. I would just remove aptitude tests altogether. Because there will be many people, many young people through schools, who, when it comes to the educational element, they might not actually have that particular ability in terms of uh, in terms of the theory but when it comes to the, the actual practical they might be world leaders 
They, they, might, they might have that world-class talent. So why put that, uh, that actual obstacle in their way at that particular point in their, in their journey in life? So I, I generally, I, I personally would actually go I'd be stronger in that. And just uh, my final point, uh, presenting officer, is just on the issue, once again, of the issue of uh, people learning instruments outside of school. In my constituency, I'm uh, delighted that we've got, uh, we've got a, a wide variety of bands who compete, perform, and win uh, on an annual basis. The Riverside Youth Band, based in Port Glasgow, Lower Clyde Pipes and Drums, uh, and, and obviously covering all of Inverclyde. Now, and certainly with Lower Clyde Pipes and Drums, they started off just as, because th there was nothing for many years. So I, I just I want to thank, once again, my colleagues for their work, and I also want to thank every single person who does teach music, whether they're in school or outside. Thank you very much. Rachel Hamilton, followed by Angus MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Firstly, I want to thank the Education and Skills Committee for their detailed report, and which drew evidence from a wide range of stakeholders. The committee reported and noted that without action, the journey of young talent from Scottish state schools into bands, orchestras, and to become the teachers of the future will be very difficult. We know that the number of music instructors working in Scottish schools has fallen to an all-time low. There are now just 667 dedicated music tutors serving primary and secondary schools compared to 1,043 in 2007. Ultimately, the effects of this decline in participation in music tuition are being manifested in a form of Scottish cultural deficit, a ticking time bomb of unintended consequences which could last a generation whereby we could lose a steady stream of talented young musicians along with their skills and talents, draining the very lifeblood from Scotland's creative sector. Scotland, as we know, accounts for 11% of the UK's live music revenue and music tourism brings in around 280 million a year to Scotland and secures 2,000 full-time jobs. In 2015 alone, some 720,000 foreign and domestic visitors came to the country for festivals and major musical concerts. Kirk Richardson, convener of the Instrumental Teachers Network said, and I quote, if music tuition is allowed to die, there will be a huge commercial loss to this country. We need to wake up to that. Presiding officer, we cannot simply sit back and let this happen. We need to see the Nicola Benedettis, James McMillans and the Lewis Capaldis showcase, showcase Scotland's musical talent to the world. We know from research that learning to play an instrument can provide intellectual, physical and emotional stimulation and help in areas of concentration, focus and perseverance. It offers social uh, opportunities with like-minded children who may join a band, an ensemble or orchestra. And just like children who play sports, participating in an orchestra or band can build friendships. I recently had the pleasure of going along to the St. Boswell's uh, Music Brass Band in my own constituency and they're a young band uh, uh, that have just formed and they ha had you could just see the pleasure in their eyes. It was a wonderful experience. I want to go on to say and quote the uh, Musical Education Partnership Group, uh, who said that in addition to enhanced mental and physical health and well-being, the benefits to the child include the development of transferable skills such as teamworking, resilience, discipline, uh, performing, problem solving, evaluating abstract thinking, physical and fine motor coordination. Playing an instrument can also offer help uh, to children and young people to cope with uh, school and social media pressure and the, and the pressure, of course, of exams by allowing time out. My youngest daughter does exactly that. She takes a break from homework by playing the piano or singing. And her singing has led her to um, perform in the National Choir of Scotland uh, just this year in Perth. Um, and it was an incredible uh, performance led by um, the composer Christopher Bell. To go on, the report concludes that music tuition could be provided free of charge. However, at the same time, the committee acknowledged that financial decision-making should rest with local authorities. Many of us, including COSLA, note that there have been no suggestions of how free music tuition would be funded or could be funded. Uh, Liz Smith, uh, my colleague, mentioned uh, a, a similar um, to a music endowment fund set up perhaps through... Um, Philanthropy and the government, which is one way, and 
um, perhaps these uh, discussions could go further. We know that the Cabinet Secretary himself said in evidence to the committee, it is the responsibility of local authorities to ensure that pupils in their area are not prevented from learning a musical instrument because of their background, location, disability or financial circumstance. And currently only 27 uh, of the 32 local authorities uh, charge a fee um, of some kind for instrumental music lessons. Um, four introduced fees in 1819 and eight raised fees, the highest fee being in Clackmannanshire. The cost, the total cost of instrumental music services is approximately 30 million, as we've heard today, and tuition charges across Scotland raise approximately four uh, million per annum. So there seems to be um, some sort of uh, funding challenge there. And as a member, uh, along with Tom Arthur and Gordon Lindshurst of the Music CBG, I'm acutely aware of the challenges that young, uh, young people and their families face when it comes to funding lessons. We know that the fees associated with instrumental music tuition has led to a significant reduction in uptake. And whilst we support local decision making, no one can uh, be content with pupils in one council paying more than £500 for music lessons whilst other Others receive it for free. And that vicious postcode lottery cannot be allowed to continue. The local authorities currently part fund, as I said, those concessionary rates by charging those who do not qualify for exemption and pupils entitled to free school meals or family in receipt of housing benefit or income support will in some local authorities be exempt from the charges. But this is not consistent from Scotland, across Scotland and we've heard that today. In addition, uh, just 10 local authorities currently offer a sibling discount and perhaps that's something that other local authorities uh, could take on board. And local authorities, along with the uh, government, do need to look at new ways of exploring uh, introducing a range of exemptions and concessions more consistently across the country. Um, just to uh, finish, uh, presiding officer, I just want to mention Ralph Ridioff, who said that this postcode lottery is not fair, it's not consistent, and it's, it is a matter of grave concern to the Scottish Government. And I do know that the Cabinet Secretary is taking on this on board. But in conclusion, presiding officer, the declining music particip participation is a worrying trend which must be reversed. And the committee report was excellent, but let's see action from now on. Thank you. Angus MacDonald, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Okay, thank you, President Officer. Um, I welcome uh, this debate, uh, which is the culmination of the Education and Schools Committee's inquiry and also uh, a petition which came to the Public Petitions Committee uh, around the same time, calling on the Scottish Government to make it a right for every child in school to receive instrumental music tuition free of charge. Uh, the decision was taken by the PPC Committee to refer the petition to the Education and Skills Committee for consideration as part of its ongoing inquiry at the time, uh, after we had taken valuable evidence on the issue. It was highlighted at that point uh, the importance of the arts in a child's life and the educational benefit that music and creativity could have on attainment, a point on which we all agree, I'm sure. Um, there won't be anyone here in this chamber who doesn't want children to, to learn music, but it's accepted widely that there are different approaches to the same issue across the country, and not one approach is, is right or wrong. There is a question, however, of how children can access instrumental music tuition equitably across the country, and that appears to be more of a complex conundrum than it would first appear. All 32 local authorities provide music tuition as part of core curriculum from P1 to S3, However, as noted by COSLA in their briefing, uh, this differs from instrumental music tuition, which is a discretional service offered additionally and complementary to the curriculum, which has a cost attached that has to be paid for. And as we've heard already this afternoon, this creates a varied picture across the country in how local authorities cover those costs, some charging pupils and some not. There is, however, a question of access, how affordable it is for children from low-income families but are not eligible for any exemptions to access that tuition. This question should be answered within the context of the child being interested or learning to play an instrument, or for that matter, if instrumental music tuition would positively influence that child's learning and help them further their own attainment. So looking at the situation in my own constituency of Falkirk East, Falkirk Council unfortunately impose a charge for their instrumental music service with exemptions for pupils in P4 to S6 who are eligible for free school meal entitlement or school, school clothing allowance. Uh, and the annual concerts put on by the Instrumental Music Service in Falkirk have always been a highlight of the year, 
which gives pupils involved from across the district the chance to showcase what they've learned through their music lessons. And of course, the Youth Music Initiative, as in the rest of Scotland, also plays a major part in Falkirk District, with pupils able to access music opportunities through their programmes too. Uh, and I've been a strong supporter of YMI going back to the days uh, when I served on the Council and its Education Committee. YMI has proved to be of huge benefit to pupils across the country and in Falkirk District, where it also funds considerably the Falkirk Traditional Music Project. Now, the Falkirk Traditional Music Project offers young people from P4 to S6 the opportunity to learn a traditional Scottish instrument. The Trad Music Project offers tuition and the loan of instruments at no cost to the pupils, with tuition available in the mandolin, chanter, accordion, whistle, bagpipes, fiddle and baran. Uh, professional traditional musicians teach the lessons after school at Falkirk High School, and it's extremely successful. Uh, and, President Officer, I know of one person in particular who has benefited from YMI and learning music in school who is looking to go on to become a musician and tutor in the trad music scene. However, if this pr provision had not been available to her while she was at school, her career may have taken an altogether different direction and we, never, we may never have been on the cusp of discovering the next big trad artist in Scotland. So when looking at this issue, we should always keep in mind what we want the future to be. Questions over the kind of country we want to be also include issues like this. How much exposure to creativity would we like our children to have now in order to give them the opportunities to shape a creative career or life in the future? Now, we know that Scotland benefits both culturally and economically from the likes of Skippinish, Scary War, Man Ran, and other trad rock groups heading all over the world to showcase the best of Scottish talent. We have a long history of musical quality across the decades in Scotland, so it's plain to see that Scotland's music has a wide-reaching and proud heritage spanning many years. However, do we really want a legacy of children unable to afford music lessons at school becoming apparent in 20 or 30 years' time with the resultant talk about a lost, a lost generation of talent? Presiding Officer, um, in closing, the future where Scotland is promoted on the world stage as it is today by musical talent, too numerous to mention in this debate, could be lost if all pupils are unable to access IMT equitably. And I would join other members in urging local authorities and the government to find a suitable solution to this issue as soon as possible in order to avoid the possibility of a lost generation of musicians. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, I, I recall uh, as a Minister uh, for Transport, Infrastructure and Climate Change, uh, attending on behalf of Adam Ingram, who was one of my fellow ministers who couldn't go, uh, are getting it right for every child event uh, on the 12th of March 2010 at 11.30 a.m. at Petodri Stabian in uh, Aberdeen. And uh, we arrived a little early and there was a presentation uh, from a psychologist, complete with a bit of film, and it showed a one hour old child, one hour old. And what this child was actually doing was lying on its back, not surprisingly, and it was having music played to it. And it was doing this with its arms, beating its arms together in syncopation with the music. The music was then switched off. The music, he stopped doing the moving the arms. The music was switched on and the child was doing it again. And I found that immensely moving, but in this context, absolutely fascinating. That the effect of music on somebody who was one hour out of the womb was so significant. And I happen at the moment to be surrounded by a number of uh, uh, female friends who are pregnant and they say that actually playing classical music is making the palpitations in the womb uh, diminish as the child, even in the womb, is responding to music. So for my part, should there be any doubt whatsoever about the beneficial effects of music upon us all in our psychology and our physiology, uh, that Gerfeck event led me uh, to, to that understanding. 
Um, I'm kind of with Ross Greer and with Tavish Scott in that my musical competence is, uh, could barely be described as limited. Um, at primary school, there was an attempt to teach me the violin, which I, I have to say, uh, utterly, utterly failed. My only musical instrument competence is I can uh, use a spoon on my teeth and by flexing my cheeks, change the note uh, that comes out. Uh, to describe it as music, I think, would be uh, grossly uh, exaggerating. Um, I wanted to intervene on Tavish Scott on an important point when he was talking about uh, the Shetland uh, fiddle achievements. Um, and I very much love the fiddle music uh, from, from Shetland. Because if we're talking about postcodes on provision of musical tuition, we want to make sure that we do include the ability to have variation that preserves, enhances, and develops local variations in the instruments they used, and in the case of Shetland, how the bow is used on the fiddle, uh, which, is, uh, which is quite different from elsewhere. Um, I, I, I think I've got a love of music, I suppose, uh, in part, a very significant uh, part of my life was that my very first date with the person who this year will have been married to me for 50 years uh, was I suggested we go to the Dubliners concert in the Music Hall in Aberdeen in 1966. Um, it may have been uh, the, f the first time she had seven drunken nights, uh, but it was not the first time to which I've been exposed to the same uh, as a student. Today, at the moment, I find myself greatly enamored by uh, three Quebecois groups, uh, Soldat Louis, Salome Leclerc, and Vaughan du Nord, who have a range of instruments they play. And one of them they play uh, that I could just about to deal with uh, Vent du Nord is the, the Jaws harp, where you stick this little bit of metal in here and you ping uh, the, the, the metal there. And, and that might be something uh, I, could, uh, I could do. Um, I think, uh, too, if you examine with a very powerful magnifying glass uh, the cover of one of the 12-inch LPs that we have at home of the Corries, you will see among the approximately 1,000 people that are probably in the photograph, there we are sitting in the front row. So music's been uh, a very important part. Incidentally, um, the, 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 the Dubliners, of course, one of the reasons they came to fame uh, was uh, through a guy called Rohan O'Rahilly, who was an Irishman, not too surprisingly, uh, but was actually the founder and owner of Pirate Radio Caroline. And they were uh, an immensely popular uh, radio station that played the Dubliners uh, in enormous uh, amount indeed. Now, presenting officer, I've uh, very much enjoyed uh, reading the committee's report. Um, I have got two music teachers in my family. My late brother-in-law was a guitar teacher, and uh, one of my nieces uh, is a music teacher in Kent. She's finding it rather sterile territory at the moment, and so she's standing on Thursday for the local council to try and do something about it. Obviously not for the SNP, so I'm uncertain as to whether I should wish her uh, all the best, but I do. <laughs> But I do. Uh, let me just close by saying my favorite piece uh, of classical music is Gustav Holt's uh, The Planets. And I think it's absolutely opposite to the debate uh, today. The people who have spoken in the debate, perhaps uh, Rachel Hamilton, is uh, Mars, the bringer of war, uh, whereas uh, Jenny Gilruth is Venus, the bringer of peace. I, for my part, of course, am clearly Saturn, the bringer of old age, but the Deputy First Minister and Education Secretary has to be Uranus, the magician. <laughs> We'll now move to the closing speeches. And I call Ian Gray for up to six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm not sure what I did to deserve having to, uh, having to follow Mr. Stevenson. But uh, uh, if I reach back slightly beyond his contribution, um, Mr. MacDonald Mr. MacDonald um, used a word uh, in, in his speech, which I think rather sums up um, the sense of this afternoon. And the word he used was conundrum. Uh, and I do think that the Chamber has, this afternoon, been wrestling with a conundrum. The conundrum is um, uh, uh, facing the realities of finance, 
uh, an acknowledgement of local democracy and a desire to provide more musical opportunity. How do we bring these things uh, together in a way that, that works uh, for us? And it's not a conundrum which is new to us. Uh, back in 2012, uh, I uh, led a members debate um, which was based on a, a campaign which was being run largely by the Scotland on Sunday newspaper at that time called Let the Children Play, uh, which was addressing similar issues to the ones that uh, we've been talking about today. And the minister who responded to me uh, on that day uh, was the, the then schools minister, Alistair Allen, who will remember this, uh, and who made a very good response. And out of that launched an initiative, the Instrumental Music Group, uh, under the chairmanship of David Green, uh, who did a lot of work uh, similar, covering similar ground to the work covered by the Education Committee and produced recommendations uh, which the, the, the government then accepted, although, uh, as the debate would uh, lead us to expect, many of those recommendations really were for local government rather than national government. So the government was certainly willing to respond, and I think today the Cabinet Secretary has been willing to respond positively to the Education Committee report as well, but we haven't really found our way uh, out of the, 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 the conundrum. Uh, uh, Russ Greer said uh, an interesting thing, I thought, he said there's no innate hostility to instrumental tuition anywhere, and I think that is abs absolutely true. Uh, and one of the, the things about the, um, uh, the evidence that the committee heard was that nobody actually argued in favour of charging for instrumental tuition. Nobody made a positive case that there should be charges for instrumental tuition. And I think that's actually quite telling. The, the government, particularly the cabinet secretary, didn't argue a positive case for charging. Indeed, today he accepted the case that there shouldn't be charging, but he did uh, uh, hold to the position as he has today that this is a decision for individual local authorities. The representatives of uh, local government who gave evidence didn't argue the positive case for charging. Uh, they uh, firstly argued the case for having the discretion to charge, uh, and secondly, uh, made many of the points that have been rehearsed today about the cuts. Uh, but they didn't really make that case uh, that charging was in any way a good thing. In fact, um, Councillor McCabe, in his response to the Education Committee, its uh, report said a very interesting thing. He said, the in principle belief that there should be no charging is probably shared by many elected members across Scotland's local authorities. The committee does not suggest how such a policy should be uh, funded. So my point is uh, that uh, uh, nobody is saying we should charge uh, and therefore I think the principle of the committee report really is established. Uh, it's not simple enough, I think, to say that some local authorities manage to keep tuition free. Uh, Daniel Johnson uh, made the point that in Edinburgh, where that is the case, it remains an extremely difficult decision every budgetary year. I referred to the pain that my own local authority went through this year uh, in introducing charging. Local authorities, councils are in an extremely difficult position uh, and these are difficult decisions that they take. The one thing which would change that, of course, would be uh, if it was established that instrumental tuition was actually a core part of schools' education and music education. I thought Mr Arthur made a very passionate case that it should be. Uh, and it will be interesting, as I say, to see uh, if that is decided in court and what the court decides. Our view on these benches is, were they to decide it is a core part of education, uh, then it's certainly the case that the Scottish Government would have to find additional resources for councils to make that uh, work. Um, there were uh, uh, some references to the good stuff which is going on, and I think quite fairly, uh, and in particular to uh, a couple of musical initiatives which are worth mentioning. One is the Youth Music Initiative. Now, uh, I think it is a great initiative, but uh, Claire Baker was absolutely right that we have to be careful because the Youth Music Initiative is about ensuring that every uh, young person has a taster uh, of instrumental tuition. Uh, and as the EIS uh, uh, report says, uh, if you don't, uh, why spark the interest if you don't intend to keep the fire burning? Rather more purple prose than the EIS usually indulge in. Uh, so uh, uh, really, the, the Youth Music Initiative is an argument for ensuring accessibility for those who want to, 
to build on that taster. And the Cabinet Secretary mentioned Sistema, of course, uh, and I am a great supporter uh, of Sistema, but we have to, and, and the government deserves great credit for the funding they've provided uh, for Sistema, but it is a different thing. Sistema takes a community and creates a critical mass of music education by providing that for pretty well everyone of the youngest age group in that area. It began, of course, in the Raplock and is now taking place in other places as well. It is an immensely powerful tool for building confidence and reducing uh, inequality. Please but it is not the close, same please. thing. It is not the same thing uh, as what the, the report uh, uh, reports on, and we've been debating this afternoon. In fact, it argues that it's even more important uh, that that please. is available right across Scotland, and we need to still find a way to make that happen. Call Oliver Mundell. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to close uh, on behalf of these benches what has been an important, informative and largely consensual debate. Um, I'd also like to echo other members in thanking uh, those who contributed to the committee report um, and to all those who provided the rich and real world evidence that have made both our inquiry and today's debate so worthwhile. The passion and the persuasive arguments have certainly resonated and there's no doubt that uh, the many campaigners who've pushed and pushed on this issue have been instrumental uh, in bringing it uh, to the fore. Um, I can honestly say uh, that there have been few inquiries in this place which have been mentioned to me so positively and so persistently as I've gone about my own constituency business. Um, and I've certainly seen uh, the strength of musical talent that the Cabinet Secretary mentioned and I'd say gently uh, to Tavish Scott, uh, that there are so many talented young musicians in Dumfrieshire, I, I would struggle to name them in the five minutes uh, that I've got left. Um, indeed, I'm not sure if I was the intended audience, uh, but at this year's Annan Academy Christmas concert, uh, I was both heartened and disheartened uh, that the music teacher who had organised the event raised the subject of instrumental music tuition uh, at the introduction uh, to the evening's festivities. I was heartened because it was inspiring and reassuring to hear someone with such a strong and personal interest spell out exactly what these policy decisions uh, mean, not just for the school or individual pupils, but for the wider community and society. He also brought home the wider question, what does uh, the decision to prize some young people out of such an important part of our culture say, not just about our education system, but about our country? And that's what made me very, very sad. At an individual level, I was also taken by how many parents then took the opportunity to mention to me the difficult choices they face in this area. The choice between sending their children uh, to band camp, buying new instruments, uh, or uh, going on family holidays. And those were the lucky ones. Uh, those were the ones who still had uh, choices. And I think it's difficult uh, to hear from parents who are struggling to justify the decision to let one of their children learn a musical instrument, uh, but not another. These are similar issues uh, to those we heard in the committee evidence. Uh, but for me, there is nothing like meeting uh, those talented young people and talking to them to understand just what this uh, issue means in practice. As we've heard today in the debate, and I thought Tom Arthur uh, captured this point really well, for lots of young people, music is not a hobby uh, or something that's an extra part of their education. It's their life and it's directly connected to their identity yeah. and their future aspirations. To deny them that because of a lottery in local authority funding or uh, school level uh, decisions is not acceptable. Um, and in reference to the points made uh, by Ross Greer, I think it's particularly disappointing uh, when we then see uh, that that lottery is turbocharged uh, by disadvantage and inequality. And it's very, very hard uh, to justify a system uh, that sees those who are most disadvantaged most likely uh, to lose out. Mm -hmm. Speaking personally, the idea that a complicated system of local government funding uh, can al be allowed to justify this level of inequality is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. The answer is not to look for rigid standardisation or to expect that every single young person in every single school will enjoy exactly the same opportunities. That, of course, would be nice in theory, but as someone representing a large and diverse rural area, I know that in practice, a one-size-all approach does not work. The 
The trick is finding a balance that works everywhere and ensures that the minimum acceptable standard of provision is freely and openly available to all, regardless of their financial circumstances. I sincerely hope uh, that the new guidance uh, will deliver, but having sat through the many evidence sessions of the committee and listened to the many voices who are experts in this area, I can completely understand and follow why many of them are skeptical after the treatment instrumental music uh, tuition has received in recent years. To some people, instrumental music tuition may not be the be all and end all. I disagree with that, and it seems that many members across this chamber do. But regardless of the importance people place on music, the problem here is that this issue is emblematic, in my view, of wider problems in Scottish education and a growing sense that things are getting worse rather than better uh, for young people, that young people are experiencing fewer choices than even when I was in school. And it is, uh, presiding officer, inescapable to me, and I don't want to uh, get too political in a committee debate, but this has all happened under a government that's so clearly taken its eye off the ball. In conclusion, presiding officer, the committee report identifies a number of important principles and points for action. The test for the government and for this parliament will be whether or not we see change on the ground. It is not too late to turn back um, because across the nation, we still have the building blocks of a world leading instrumental education system. We are, as our convener says, at a tipping point, but that does not mean that we need to tip over the edge. We do not need to accept that. Thank you. I now call John Swinney for seven minutes, please. Uh, Presiding officer, if uh, anybody wished to assess the attitude and the prevailing view about the value and the significance of music education and musical experience on the lives of any individual in our society, and particularly in a young person, uh, then the explanation provided by Tom Arthur in his speech this afternoon should give enormous comfort and reassurance to individuals about the depth of the value of music to uh, individuals in our society and young people in particular. And that point was reinforced by Jenny Gilruth's quoting of uh, Catherine Mackey, one of the young people who appeared before the Education and Schools Committee and described what we don't often hear about in many of these debates, but the impact, the outcome of her music tuition experience, which was, which was to make Catherine, in her own words, more confident, resilient, and boosted her own individual mental health, which are very strong sentiments. So that benefit, that rationale, that impact of music tuition stands in stark contrast to the observation that Liz Smith made about the comments of an English head teacher, which uh, Liz Smith's uh, um, disapproval of those remarks was widely endorsed across this chamber as being a completely and utterly inappropriate view of the world that somehow um, music tuition didn't have its place in the formative experience of young people in our society. And I wholeheartedly associate myself with Liz Smith's disapproval of those remarks. I think Ian Gray's um, assessment of Angus MacDonald's contribution in which of, of referring to this debate as a conundrum is a pretty fair assessment of the dilemmas that lie at the heart of the debate because there's one central dilemma um, which is about the degree to which this should be a matter of local discretion or whether this should be a matter of national determination. And there is of course no perfect answer to that. There is, you know, there may be halfway houses, Mr Mundell speculated that a minimum standard of provision that does not reinforce disadvantage might be the absolute minimum of a, a halfway house between the two, which is exactly where the, 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 the MIPEG process uh, and, uh, and the working group has got us to, where uh, the COSLA's Young Persons Board have agreed minimum standards of eligibility that will be observed across the country. And that is, I think, an important question. But, you know, Parliament really has to think through uh, whether it's pursuing localism or whether it's pursuing national direction. Because 
the Conservatives, if I, and I'm going to, I'm afraid I'm going to have to say a few political things in the course of this afternoon, Parliament wouldn't expect anything of me otherwise, but the Conservatives regularly come here to demand localism and attack me for centralisation, when in fact they have kind of argued today that I should be applying more centralisation and not allowing the postcode lottery that Rachel Hamilton talked about. That is what comes of local discretion unless Parliament affords me the powers to direct, which I don't currently have, and which in many respects the Conservatives reject on all occasions when it is put to them. Uh, of course. Oliver Mundell. I wonder uh, if the Cabinet Secretary realises that there's a distinction between choices that councils want to make and choices that councils have to make, and that that isn't true localism if councils are restricted in making the choices that they feel are best. John well, that, well that, that really that brings me on to my next conundrum in the debate, because it's, it's the central question of the financial context and experience of individuals. I, I just, I have absolutely, I won't give a minute's patience to the Conservatives coming here and moaning about the public finances. I asked Gordon Lindhurst what the budget proposals of the Conservative Party would have done to enhance, to have enhanced the money available on the 1st of April 2019 to local authorities around the country. And the answer to that question, of course, is nothing. Absolutely nothing. Apart from, apart from a £500 million reduction in the available public finances because of the tax cuts they wanted to put in place. Now, so I, I, don't, I, I don't say that to be kind of you know, difficult in the debate. These are the choices. These are the choices the Conservatives offer us and they, and they talk about in their press releases and they talk about in their debates and they still want us to spend more money. Now, on the other side of the argument, there are some local authorities that are clearly following the outlook and the perspective that Mr Arthur brought to the debate, that they see that, although it's tough, and I accept it's tough in local authorities, I wouldn't try to suggest anything other, but they're attaching the priority that Mr Arthur wants to have attached to music tuition in the choices that they're making, and I would simply encourage more and more local authorities to think around some of those questions as they undertake their budget decisions. If Mr Mundell, forgive me, there's two other points I want to make before I close. Mr Greer raises, I think, really quite a difficult issue to resolve, and that is the question of when does tuition relevant to the achievement of an SQA qualification begin? That is quite a difficult question to ask, because none of us, whatever, whenever we come on to discussing subject choices, which we'll discuss tomorrow, at what moment is a child on the trajectory that is heading for an SQA qualification? And when should that tuition be free? Now, the, I think the only way to answer that question that gives a proper answer to Mr Greer is that instrumental tuition shouldn't have a charge. I think that's the only way you get around that. Um, but uh, I think it's, we have to confront some of the issues that come out of that question. And the last point I want to raise, uh, presenting officer, is that Liz Smith asked me a specific point about funding for uh, uh, the Music Education Partnership Group. I, I'm under the impression that financial arrangements are acceptable to the Music Education Partnership Group. If Liz Smith's question is prompting me to go back and look at that again, just to make sure. But I do value, I want to just put on record in my closing few seconds, how much I value the work that has been done by the Music Education Partnership Group. It's of the highest quality. It's done with courtesy and energy, and it's designed to bring people together. And I hope this debate has helped perhaps bring uh, the National Parliament and our local authorities closer together in the choices that are made to try to overcome the challenges that Mr Macdonald set for us in resolving this conundrum, in which I think Parliament has had a healthy airing of some of those questions in the course of this afternoon. I now call Joanne Lamont to close the debate for the Education and Skills Committee. Uh, eight minutes should take us up to decision time, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. There, is, there are a number of challenges um, in summing up in, in a debate as the Deputy Convener of the Education Committee. One of them is that I am speaking on behalf of the committee, so I shall be doing my best to constrain my comments to that. Um, another one is to respond to some of the more engaging speeches. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to respond to Stuart Stevenson's peroration. Um, I shall go back and look at it again <laughs> um, <laughs> to get a proper 
a measure of, of, of its substance and its breadth indeed. If, if you will forgive me before I, I, I do speak on behalf of the committee, I do want to say one thing in, in, in personal terms, and that is it was a delight to be part of this committee inquiry um, because it was a reminder, of, a reminder as ever needed is just how important and powerful music can be in all of our lives. Now, I think music is partly about your culture and your background, which explains why I was listening to Callum Kennedy when everybody else was listening to the Beatles. But it's also about, and my own son learning to uh, music, the opportunities he was afforded in Glasgow to understand the joy of music for itself. And I did think that Tom Arthur's contribution, talking about the intrinsic value of music was very, very powerful indeed, because so much of this was about the other things that it gives, but just that simple sheer joy of understanding music um, and being moved by, I think, was very, very powerful uh, indeed. Um, I do want to make some comments on what members have said, but uh, there are a few notable parts of the committee inquiry and its report that I would also like to highlight. I'd like to mention, it was mentioned already by Angus MacDonald, that the petition lodged by Ralph Ridder, which called in the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to change the law to ensure that instrumental music tuition is free of charge. And I'm aware that Mr Ridder is pursuing other avenues in his petition and will not comment on, on those. But the evidence gathered by the Public Petitions Committee, of which I'm convener, was very useful indeed as a foundation for the Education and Skills Committee's inquiry. And indeed, again, we were struck by just how much people cared about these issues and the time and trouble people took to engage with the petition itself. Although the committee backs the principle that instrumental music tuition should not be charged for in any local authority, we recognise the difficult choices faced by local authorities when setting their budgets each year. As has already been said, we heard from West Lothian Council, which introduced fees of £354 in 2018-19, when it previously provided instrumental music tuition for free. This resulted in a significant reduction in students and as a consequent cut to its IMT budget from nearly £1 million to, five, to £500,000. It was clear to us that West Lothian's decision had not been taken lightly. In oral evidence, Councillor David Dodds of West Lothian Council reflected in the impact that the introduction of charges had had. He said, the problem is that although the standard charge that we have introduced might be an equal charge, it's not an equitable charge. Families who have a reasonable amount of disposable income will be able to meet the charge as well as the sibling charge. However, some families who face that charge are looking for money for it once they have paid for the basics, such as heating and food and clothing. And this was a point reflected in Ross Greer's um, contribution, but it was also one of the things we picked up that if friends were dropping out, very often a young person would then choose not, even though their family could afford it, they would choose to drop out too, and with a further uh, damage of that kind of exodus from music tuition. Despite this disparity in approaches to charging between local authorities, it's also important to state that the committee, like COSLA and the Scottish Government, does not favour a one-size-fits-all national service. The rich tapestry of Scotland's music scene, whether that be pipe bands, orchestras and classical performers, or rock and pop groups depends on a wide range of instrument tuition being offered by individual instrumental music services rather than a, narrowing, a narrower offering consisting of lower cost instruments. Members across the chamber will know themselves that different parts of the country have different musical traditions. Indeed, we've heard about them today from Shetland to, uh, downwards and strengths. And these are best supported by local services which are able to reflect those traditions. There was also, of course, concerns, and again, I think this was mentioned in the debate, that where young people drop out, the ability to create and bring together an orchestra or a band became reduced. So these broader group opportunities were also limiting um, people's uh, experience, and I think that was a point highlighted by Alison Harris. We have heard evidence that charging before reaching XQA examination level can, for some young people, preclude them from being proficient enough to pass an exam or from taking up an instrument in the first place. In its written submission, the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland stated, a child aged between eight and 10 in 2018 who cannot access instrumental tuition due to the barrier posed by fees and who is aged 18 to 20 in 10 years time of po a point of entry to higher education will not be able to demonstrate a skill level sufficient to secure entry to Scotland's National Conservatoire. In turn, this will impact upon the quality of Scotland's national orchestras another ensemble and its international reputation more broadly. For example, in one of our focus groups, 
We heard that in order to be accepted to the Royal Conservatoire's Bachelor of Education degree programme, candidates must play an advanced piano piece at interview. If piano is not widely offered by a candidate's instrumental music service, this could present a barrier to those from less affluent families who wish to become music teachers but are unable to afford private tuition. If individual music services are stretched and charges are introduced or increased year on year, we risk reducing the diversity of those who take part and therefore those who are able to pursue a career in music or indeed their love of music. The other risk is that mentioned earlier by the convener where the ongoing reduction in tutor numbers as a result of the financial situation facing instrumental musical services could reduce the diversity of instruments offered by instrumental music services. This would be a tragedy and would threaten the vibrant musical scene we all know Scotland has. We've already heard about the benefits um, of being involved with music and uh, evidence from young people talking about the importance for their confidence and their mental health the social skills, the self-confidence, learning to focus and, uh, and be creative around problem solving were all identified by the young people we spoke to as benefits of learning a musical instrument. To my mind, this sounds like the epitome of what Curriculum for Excellence aims to deliver. Successful learners, confident individuals, responsible citizens and effective contributors. If we're to retain a broad education for Scotland's young people, then opportunities such as instrumental music tuition must be preserved. And the last point I really want to make is I think what is a core issue in the report and in the debate, and that is the extent to which people, uh, if local authorities are making decisions on music tuition, are these being driven by a lack of resources? The only thing I can say is that evidence from the Education Committee over a long period of time on a broader range of issues has flattened up the issue of pressure on school resources, um, support staff and so on. So there's a broader contacts in education. But I think what this report tries to do is to say that when you are making choices where there is limited funding, do not think that music tuition is an easy cut or one that somehow is not core to the business of education. And I hope that this report is seen in that context, context, not that somehow because maybe people have made a fuss about it, we think music should be supported, but that there's a genuine understanding that music is a core part of our education and our aspiration um, for our, our young people. Um, and I look forward to continuing work alongside the Scottish Government in COSLA to making that aspiration for our young people real. Thank you very much. And that concludes the debate on a note of concern, the future of instrumental music tuition in schools. We'll move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 17113 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau setting out a revised business programme. Could I ask Graham Day to move the motion? Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And no one wishes to speak against the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 17113 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now, before we turn to decision time, uh, members may like to join me in welcoming, welcoming to our gallery the Prime Minister of Iceland, uh, Katrine Jacob's daughter. <laughs> now we only have uh, one question at decision time today. The question is that motion 17059 in the name of Claire Adamson on a note of concern, the future of instrumental music tuition in schools be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes decision time. We're going to move to members' business in the name of Miles Briggs on Parkinson's in Scotland. And we'll just take a few moments for members and the minister to change seats. A few moments.